I love to see the towns passing by and arrive these rails neath God's blue sky. Let me travel this land from the mountains to the sea, cause that's the life I believe. And when I'm gone and at my grave you stand, say God called home your rambling man. Welcome to Ramble Man Podcast, episode number 65. This one is with Ben Fields, and it's kind of more of a conversation. We talk about his podcast, South of Scruffy, and we talk about how he makes television. He's a director and a DP. It was a great, fun conversation. If you'd like more information on Ben, you can find him on Instagram at Benny Fields, B-E-N-N-Y-F-I-E-L-D-S, or you can follow South of Scruffy on Instagram or Facebook or Patreon if you just go to at or slash South of Scruffy. Give South of Scruffy a listen. Give them a subscription. It's always interesting conversations. Our sponsor this week is Feral Giant. Feral Giant is a graphic design, illustration, and social media company based in Knoxville, Tennessee, though they do work for companies all over. If it's digital or creative, they've got you covered. For more information on Feral Giant, visit feralgiant.com or on any of the social at Feral Giant. We appreciate them being a sponsor of this podcast. Without much further ado, here's the conversation with Ben. Yeah, so, you know, when the dragon became a White Walker, I just couldn't <laughs> handle it anymore. Never again. <laughs> this will become a drinking game. I have never seen one episode of Game of Thrones. Yeah, no, I, I listened to uh, I listened to the episode that you did with with Brian Strutz. Oh yeah, I heard that it started out that way. <laughs> I think he was getting angry at me because we was weren't he? talking about pizza, oh. and I was just he was like, "Screw it, let's just talk about movies." I was like, "We'll get there, we'll get there, brother." <laughs> Hell, the the last one I recorded in Orlando, Florida, with this couple that owns an online brand. I'm gonna have to text them and say, "How do I need to say what you do?" Because it's like they're called Hellcats. They're like I called them retro bike motorcycle chic. That's like their what? style. They they produce like banners and stickers and badges and Hellcats. Hellcats. They're awesome. Great great people. Uh, but half the podcast is me trying to sell them on coming to Knoxville. Really? I'm like, oh yeah, Knoxville, we have this and it's awesome. And they're like, really? I was like, about three quarters of the way through, I was like, holy shit, I've talked about Knoxville a lot on this damn podcast. <laughs> it's like, you know, cheap flats are cheap from Orlando and Knoxville, man. We got Allegiant now. A Legionnaire. <laughs> you got to pay to wear your belt on there, but. <laughs> have you got socks on? <laughs> you mother. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh Okay, so you do your podcast out in your shop. Yeah, I do. How are you liking it so far? I'm liking it. I've done I've done nine episodes. I've actually okay. recorded 11. I'm putting my ninth one out Smart Monday. Man. I've got a couple in the bank <laughs> at all times. I've enjoyed it, man. It's been interesting. It's been it's been interesting finding my voice, you know? Right. Um and figuring out figuring out who I am as a personality with air right. quotes, you know? Oh my god. I just try to not repeat the same stories over and over again. Yeah. But it never fails. They yeah, I think I'm, I might be doing that. <laughs> I, I don't think I remember anything that really stands out. I go back and I and I li- and and my thing is I, I thank people too much. Thank thank guys, I appreciate you listening. Thank you so much. Oh. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. I I, re- I I really appreciate it. I really do. <laughs> See, I try to keep my, try to keep my intros so, short and sweet. I was like, they don't want to uh-huh. hear me talk. Right. They want to hear me talk. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they don't want to hear me talk to myself. <laughs> they won't hear me talk to other. Yeah, I've I've played with that a little bit too. Like, what is the intro just strictly introducing, you know, my guest, or yeah. is there some anecdote or something that can that can go in there? Is there is there a way to still make it about my guest, but uh, but also interject a little bit of me because that's something I keep hearing too is, um, from people who are listening is like I, I don't get any of your story on there, so. Yeah. 
That's I've why th- I was happy to do this. I've <laughs> thought about doing that the reverse way of having someone interview me. Uh huh. But then I had someone interview me for something else. Right. And I was like, this is painful. Really? Because you don't know how to ask questions. Like they've never interviewed oh, anybody. Yeah, yeah. And I, th- I think, because I've done like, uh, all kinds of different things where I've had to interview people right. to where now it's like, I know like, okay, I, I can make it up on the go and write down questions as we go. Yeah. Like I, I went in to interview this guy, Mark Barnes about therapy. That one just posted. I had zero questions in my mind. And as we talked, I was like, I'll get there. Mm-hmm. We'll get there. Yeah. That, that's why it didn't scare me to start a podcast yeah. where I interviewed people because I had uh, a lot of experience doing it for, for yeah. in video stuff, you know? Yeah directing you know things over the years and and having to draw sound bites out of people oh, now yeah. it is different though this yeah. thing that we're doing here you know we're trying to kind of avoid dead air a little bit whereas with yeah. with with video stuff i just need that golden sound bite to come out of your mouth it doesn't have to be a good conversation i just need that <laughs> that one piece and so it is a little bit different i'm definitely learning i hope i'm getting better um, oh, yeah. I, I'm glad I've got my wife because she's she'll t- she'll shoot me straight. She listens to all the episodes. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the I'm trying to think. I think I'm one, maybe two episodes behind right now. Oh, well, think, thanks for listening, man. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I think I didn't know about it until Rebecca posted yeah. about being on there. And yeah. I was like, oh, shit. Oh, okay. Hers, her podcast has done really well. Yeah. Yeah, I ended up. We grabbed a beer later and talked, and she was oh, like, good. "She was like, I don't know if I went." I was like, "No, you're That's fine. Great. You're fine. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. Everything's fine. You didn't say anything horrible. You didn't talk about you know killing babies or anything. You just yeah, it was great. Yeah, was I, great. Saw, I saw her the next uh, a couple days later, and she was like, "I had a real vulnerability hangover after that." And I was like, "I didn't know that was a thing," but uh, she opened up, man. I mean, it it was. It was a good one. They've they've all they've all been great in their yeah. in their own way, uh, and I've enjoyed listening to yours too, oh, man. Thank you. This is great. I was going to say I'm trying to think because I think I'm up to fifty nine. Yeah, I think that's what I saw. Fifty nine, and I've only had to edit two. No oh, good. And it was the people asking me to edit. Oh okay. And one of the well, hell I can't say it on here. It was just a very uh, they were a little bit more open than they should have been. Yeah. And they were like, mm, that could have bad repercussions. So yeah. can you please clip that out? And I was like, yeah, I don't care. Yeah. I was like, do you hear the shit I talk about? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> the shit I talk about. The only one, the one that's floating that may not get released is my cousin and I did an episode on political science and politics. And did and it get pretty pretty gritty? <laughs> it's two white boys talking about that. So oh, it's, yeah. it's, but it's weird in that we were just kind of like, no, this is how we feel. Like he... The one here, I'll go ahead and float one idea that I'm still chewing on, which is he says cancel culture isn't real. He's like Louis C.K. still touring. Yeah, he's like about the only one that's affected is Cosby, and he is only and getting affected because he's old. Because he's old as shit. Yeah. If he wasn't old as shit, that's like he's also a monster. But yeah, <laughs> or but he was going through it, and I was like, holy shit, he's kind of right. Yeah, kind of right. It's. That's a weird thing, but we really got into. I, I got to think about that. It's like three and a half hours long. I've got to listen to yeah. it, and I think I'm gonna send it to my cousin's husband, <laughs> his sister's husband, and say, "Okay, you listen to this too, and you see what you think," because <laughs> you'll be my editor on that one. It's like, do I need to cut anything? I don't know. So, do you put one out every week? It's every other week. Every other week. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I have three podcasts and a fourth one. That I'm thinking about bringing back. Cool. Uh, the one I do for Visit Knoxville is called Why Knox. It's one a month. Cool. Ramble Man is every other week. There's one on movies that I haven't released yet called Big Man, Big Fan. <laughs> to where I've banked like 20 episodes. Really? But uh, what I want to do is, God, I don't think I've talked about this on here. Uh, do like, okay, every Wednesday a free episode comes out. Cool. And then the next week, a Patreon episode comes out. And yeah. then next week, a free. And then Patreon, it's... The Patreon are normally going to be film commentaries where I sit down and watch a film with somebody and we just... Oh, cool. But I can't get people to do it. It's it's too much time. Which is you hilarious. Can't get pe- you can't get people to be guests on the show? Yeah, to, yeah. Be, to do commentary. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, that's like three hours, you know, that I, I was like, okay. 
It's like, but I get people to do six hours on Ramblin' Man. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's hilarious. So I've switched it up, and I think I'm going to do a thing with my cousin, because he's a big film nerd, too, and do uh, first take, second take, where he, I'm going to make him watch a film for the first time and then get his thoughts on it. Oh, okay. And then talk to him about it. And then cool. second take would be a film that got crapped on that we still <laughs> think is good, and my example is Tron Legacy. Tron Legacy is great. Haven't seen it. And everybody shit on it. Yeah. All the critics crapped. I was like, great score from Daft Punk, and it's not what you would think from them. It's like the visuals are gorgeous. Did they, they do the whole score? Yeah. Oh, wow. It's it's what I work to most of the time. Really? It's great. But they uh, everybody crapped on it and said, oh, it's too complicated. And it's like, have you... Like, storyline-wise? Yeah. It's like, huh. have you seen Tron 1? Tron 1 is a mess. <laughs> like, of course it's complicated. <laughs> if you can't figure out... I was like, and I watched it twice. I was like, no, I got it. I was like, whatever. <laughs> whatever man but, I, but that's that's and the other one is i did one called southern charm with a buddy of mine michael may who moved to minnesota when he was 19 he's now 45 and i was reintroducing him to positive southern culture i like that but i th he we have a hard time because he wants to record it like the third sunday of every month at nine o'clock i'm like i i can't stick he's to, still up there yeah Okay. I was so like, you guys I can't have to do the remote Skype thing. It. Yeah, we Skype it. So I think I'm thinking about doing it and finding people who are not from the South and doing the same thing to where it's not him, to where it'll be a different person yeah. every time. And like strangers or yeah. people you know. That'd be cool to just track bit. down some strangers on yeah. Instagram or something. Yeah. Be like, oh, you're new to town? Cool. Let's let's sit down and talk. Yeah. And it's it's a shorter one. Like it's less than thirty minutes. Yeah. It's usually uh he brought a song that was southern didn't matter if it's punk, country, rap, doesn't yeah. matter. I found an article that was interesting, Southern culture. Then we talked about topic, like the last one was TVA. Yeah. And uh, then I give him a recipe, and then we do <laughs> another song, and that's the podcast. Like, it's that's super cool. simple. Try to keep it positive, because we live in now times, and yeah, it's hard to yep. be positive now. I was like, but we talked, I was like, I can't wait to talk about Dolly Parton. It's like Dolly Parton is a is a god. Like she's having a moment. Yeah, Dolly Parton. We can talk about moonshine. We can talk yeah. about uh, William Faulkner. Like yeah, there's all this stuff. Yeah, that there's Garden and Gun right there. Like that magazine. That's a great magazine. Yeah, I like I like so what they're doing uh, with that thing. So yeah, and it's funny because like people are more and more people are getting into podcasts. I'm like, no, do it. I want to hear everybody. Yeah. I told her, I was like, when are you going to do a podcast? She needs to do one. I, I, I've been pushing her to, I've been like, yeah. I want to hear it. And she's like, I was like, you got to figure out what your thing is. Yeah. You got to be able to boil it down to like two sentences. Mm -hmm. So you can tell people who don't know you. Yeah. And she was like, okay, I think she keeps working about it and thinking about it. It took well, me a solid year to, okay. to really, to really land, land on mine format wise. Yeah. Um, what who I wanted to talk to, the kinds of people I wanted to talk to, um, and then it, it coming up with a title for the show was yeah. What took six months for me. Yeah. I mean, I've got a list of them, <laughs> you know, hundreds of them on there. Um, and then you know, music, yeah, <laughs> finding the music and the artwork, yeah. And I made my artwork for my podcast to, as a mock up to show some to show another designer. I was like, here's kind of the elements I want to involve. <laughs> And then I was like, you know, fuck it, man. I'm ready to get this podcast out there. <laughs> and so I put it out there with this terrible artwork that I made in Apple Pages. And <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I am not a graphic designer yeah. by any stretch. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I, I think my, my buddy finally felt sorry for me. And he was like, hey, man. <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Ready. I'll, I'll expedite this oh for you God. so you don't have to. I'll move have this that. up in the yeah, queue. Because yeah, oh, no, I can't take man. it every week oh seeing that shitty artwork come across my phone. Uh, I can't. It took me forever to come up with the name for this. I was yeah. mowing my yard and Hank Williams Sr.'s Ramblin' Man yeah. came on. And I was like, holy shit, that's good. That's I'm a huge Hank Sr. fan. So what's funny is my buddy Sean, who gets mentioned on every podcast, Pointner, if you know, do you know Sean? Uh, Central I, Collective? I know the name. Yeah. So he, every time I mention the name of my podcast, he starts singing. He goes, Lord, I was born a ramblin'. I was like, wrong song, yes, Sean, wrong yeah. song. Uh -huh. He's like, yeah, Ramblin' Man, you know, Lord, I was like, I'm going to punch you. I'm going to punch you in the dick. I, mean, I was born in the backseat of a Greyhound bus, right? That is, that's it. It's like, I'm going to punch you, you bastard. Uh, Hank Sr. is fantastic, man. Yeah. He died when he was like, what, 
twenty nine or thirty. Oh yeah, something like that. Had spina bifida. Been a twenty seven. Was he a twenty seven guy? He may have been. Yeah, he was close. That's what kills me about Otis Redding, man. You look at him; he he looks forty. Really? And he was twenty six, twenty seven when he died. I didn't know that. Yeah, and it's like, dude, you look forty. Yeah. (laughs) You sing like you're 60. Yeah. Like, holy shit. Yeah, man. When I turned 28, I was like, great. I did it. <laughs> I well, I'm it. definitely not famous. <laughs> definitely not going to go down in history. <laughs> As a 27-year-old that died I way too soon. I can't remember turning. To- Good God. I'm on the other side of 40 now. I yeah, don't I'm, know. I'm 34 now, but when I when I made it past 27, I was like, yeah, all right. I had a friend of mine that he, I remember him standing, looking out at the at the sky and he was like when i turn 30 everything's gonna clear I was like, no it's not uh-uh. you're still a dumbass like, yeah <laughs> he was 29 at the time i was like nothing will change yeah nothing will change you'll turn 30 it'll be another day yeah you'll be fine i think I, I may have mentioned this on my podcast but somebody broke it down into decades for me when i was 23 years old yeah. worried about what the rest of my life was gonna yeah. look like and he's this brilliant businessman and he said your 20s are for experimenting your 30s are for establishing your 40s are for accelerating. Your 50s and 60s are for giving back. And I was like, you know, that's kind of brilliant. Yeah. And I no longer feel pressured to need to know at 23 years old exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fuck off for the next seven years until <laughs> I turn 30. <laughs> And then, uh, and and then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna hunker down for the next few decades. <laughs> I always feel like I'm out in public. I'm like, shouldn't an adult be? Oh shit, yeah. <laughs> I'm the adult. Damn it! Oh, that's how that's how I feel like when I'm taking care of my kids at the house. And yeah. I'm like, man, <laughs> I can't wait. We need adults. Yeah, game. yeah. <laughs> we, we need some supervision. <laughs> Somebody's gonna get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's I've talked. It's kind of weird being a single dude at this age because it's like. I was talking to somebody the other day. I was like, I, I was hanging out with a friend till three in the morning, smoking cigars and shooting the shit. And we, I'm going to get, I'm going to be a little honest here. Uh, we had just enough cigar left to where I was like, we got about 45 more minutes. What's something I can say that will prompt us for 45? I was like, who's your Knoxville crush? And he went, Oh shit. Like, and he started putting his hands together. He's like, all right, let me think about this. Let me think about this. <laughs> and we went for 45 minutes. I was like, that was a good one. That was a good yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. But I was like, I'm never going to regret being a jackass and staying up till three or four in the morning, hanging out with him, talking about stupid shit. Yeah. Other than getting four more hours sleep. Yeah. Like, I'll sleep while I'm dead. Like the accelerating thing that I, I wonder if I'm still lagging a little bit behind in the 30 year old. No, I think you're. I think you're good. This is full yeah. acceleration mode for yeah. you right now. Yeah, it feels like I stayed up till three thirty last week, and it was it was terrible. I yeah. uh, my kids didn't give a shit that I stayed up until three thirty in the morning drinking beer with my buddies. They didn't care at all. <laughs> they, yeah. they still woke up at seven jumping on me. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I've got a friend. His mom's dog was staying at his house. He's like, my mom gets up at five thirty. I don't. Yeah, that damn dog was in my bed going, hey, hey. <laughs> Hey, I need food. Hey, hey, hey. He's like, damn it. <laughs> We're going to have to adjust while you're here, man. We're going to have to adjust that. Uh, how Did you go to school for video? I, I did. I went to a film school in South Carolina called Carolina Film Institute. It's a private okay. school. It's a sister school of Seattle Film Institute okay. in Seattle. They wanted an East Coast presence. They opened the school in okay. I was actually supposed to go to Blue Ridge Motion Pictures, which was in Asheville, North Carolina, and that was the same type of program. It's nice. about a year and a half, two years of total film immersion and no nothing else, no math, no English, no oh science. God. And that school closed three weeks before I was supposed Holy to go there. Shit. And so and I had a place to live in Asheville. I was so pumped to live in Asheville and so excited. And they were like, Well, we're closing down due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> uh, but we do have a place as a backup in Greenville, South Carolina. And I was like, I don't know anything about Greenville, South Carolina. It was an hour away from Asheville, yeah. maybe 45 minutes, yeah. depending. And um, I loved it, man. I loved it. But three weeks, it like turned. It's it's, a, it's like the butterfly effect. Like yeah. what, you know, yeah. and my life would be completely different if I would have lived in Asheville instead of Greenville yeah. for that, you know, that time of and it's, that it span was, of school. It was also a weird point in Asheville in that you could be walking down the street and you'd be the only one on the street. My friend Deanne said yeah. that. She was like, 15, 20 years ago, you could walk down the street and no one else would be out there. Yeah. And now it's just, God, that school would flourish now. Yeah, I know. Um, it was, 
uh, it was where Highland Highland Brewing Company is yeah. in Asheville. The it was in the same building. Oh my god! Yeah, I I want to say it was built for some film set a long time ago, huh. but it was in the same building as Highland. And when I was going there, or when I was when I had been accepted and was about to go there, um, Highland was already in there, but it was like a really small part yeah. of the building. Yeah. And now Highland Brewing Company is the whole building that was the school and everything. It's that whole campus. That's there. crazy. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, okay. So you ended up at what? Were you always fiddling around? Let's see. So that had been 16 years ago. You were in high school. Uh, so after were, high school, I went to Bearden you, High School. I moved to Los Angeles for two years. Okay. I went. Well, you went to UT for a semester and then decided I was done with school. <laughs> and so I moved to LA to, you know, follow my dreams. Yeah. It's hard for a 19-year-old, 20-year-old to oh, live in Los Angeles by themselves. Yeah. But but I did it. I'm alive, yeah. Yeah. barely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But Got this scar yeah, right here, yeah, uh, that one and some others. Um, <laughs> but the first, uh, the first job the, I was, I was working at, uh, I was working at Subway making sandwiches, making minimum, sandwich minimum wage. I was a sandwich artist, man. Yeah, the Italian BMT. I was your guy. Um, what but is BMT? my MT. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it stands for. Still, bacon, mutton, and tomato. Yeah, yeah, I think it's mutton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, but I, uh, I I I was dating this girl that was in my uh, that was in my acting classes, and she was like, "Hey man, one of my friends is a producer on this reality TV show. Yeah, she needs some some PAs. Uh, you want to do it? It's hundred bucks a day for twelve to fourteen hour days. I was like, absolutely, I'm in. Yeah. Little did I know that also is minimum wage when you bring yeah. it down. Yeah. But at least I was doing something cool. It yeah. felt like I was doing something important. And then um, from working on that, from working on that TV show, um, they the production company that was doing the TV show noticed that I was happy to be there and working hard and yeah. the hardest working PA there. And they so they hired me on staff at their production company. Wow. Um, after that, so I uh, worked for them making 600 bucks a week as a PA at, wow. at a place called the Greif Company. And I was so happy to be there and so excited, but I didn't really know a lot. Yeah. You know, I, I knew how to be, I, I knew how to be a hard worker. I knew how to be a production assistant, but you I didn't. You knew you wanted to be there. Yeah, I did. And, and I secretly thought that it was going to help me, uh, uh, that it was going to help me backdoor my way into the acting career that okay. I had been excited about being in theater growing up. I was going to say, so in Bearden, you were theater. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was in, uh, yeah, I kind of came into it late. Okay. Um, I think my junior and senior year, um, I, I really got into it. I loved it. always loved performing, um, but I made it into the advanced acting program, Bearden High School, my senior year. And then um, I got cast as Hamlet in our, in our, uh, in our production of Hamlet. It was a big, you know, the biggest one the school does the year. And that changed my life, man. I mean, learning yeah. Shakespeare and, and f- like... It was the, if you asked me what I did in high school, I would tell you it was that play. Like, that's pretty much all, yeah. I, all I remember. And, and, and that got me, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty decent at this. You know, yeah. I, I think I can, I think I can do this. Yeah. And so that's what gave me the bug to move out to LA and kind of study it. And then, okay. but that's how I kind of came into the, came into the, the uh, <laughs> film and TV world was through the, thinking I was going to become a famous actor. What school did you go to out in LA? It's called the Acting Corps, C O P C O R P S. Okay. And it was cool. We did Meisner Technique and um, yeah. Anton Chekhov was another uh, kind of guy that we studied. And um, it was it was like boot camp is kind of yeah. what they called it. It was it was like nine or ten week sessions. And then I did improv classes at the Groundlings too. Nice. Um, and I, I just did their, I just did their like basic improv class at the Groundlings. Kind of wish I would have stuck with that a little bit. That was who would have been there at that time. There the was, Groundlings. Yeah, I'm trying um, to think. I want to say there, uh, this dude named Nat Faxon was there. Oh yeah, you know him, the writer. Yep. He Academy he, Award he, winner. He, yeah, yeah. And he was there. I always thought he was really funny. Yeah. Um, he was there at the time. There were a couple other people. The what's the Reno nine one one? Wendy. Oh, Cubby. Wendy McCall and yeah. whatever. She just left there, I okay. think. Um, a couple of a couple other folks. I was I was just doing one class there on Saturdays. Oh, okay. In, in little beginner improv class, and then, and that was right toward that was towards the end of my uh, L A. stint. So then I moved back moved back to was Knoxville. It, okay. Was it hard to find? Because coming from here, 
Like, was it hard to find friends or people or b- because you were in that industry, it was a little easier? Well, my, I mean, my acting school is where I'm, is where I met a lot of my friends, yeah. really. Yeah. And then I had a very dear friend in Knoxville named Josh Lowry, who okay. uh, I met him at our orientation for waiting tables at Ruby Tuesday the week the <laughs> the summer before I moved to LA. Oh my god! Okay. We met there at, at Ruby Tuesday. He was coming off a hard time, kind of needed to get away from yeah. some of his older yeah. his old, old crowd of friends, and he was looking for new buddies. And I was looking for new buddies. All my friends were in college, go, yeah. you know, going to school yeah. and doing something with their lives. And he and I were. You were hanging out. Something? You were going to work at Ruby Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, we were, man. I was the worst server they had. <laughs> but he and I met, and and after, and I moved to L.A. a few months later, and he came out to visit me, and he's like, "Man, like, he's like, I think I want to move out here with you." Yeah, and I was like, "Man, do it." Yeah. So he went home. He sold his uh, lawn care company that he was doing on the side. Sold it and. Uh, and he moved out to LA w- with shit. me, and we and uh, and we lived there together. Now he's uh, now he's <laughs> the lead editor on Dancing with the Stars or something. Oh like my that. god! Like, okay, he he got into the production assistant gig the same way. Yeah, I did. I got him his first job as a PA, and he just did the same thing. Just worked his way up on the post production side. He's a little more introverted in spirit, and so he <laughs> liked uh, sitting in a sitting in a room with a computer is more his speed than it was oh mine. My god. And so he. Uh, he worked his way up all the way from the bottom, and now he's he is a um, he's a bona fide lead it's a big editor. Deal. Mm-hmm. BFD, yeah, he is. That's amazing. Or yeah. BFE, big fucking editor. Yeah, he is. <laughs> he is. He's one of my best friends. I, I still talk to him all the time. That's I amazing. love the guy. And yeah, we don't. Anytime I'm in LA, I, he's, I see him. Anytime he's here. We hang out. It's, and he's, that's what he wants to do. Like that. Yeah. He's, he's good at it too. He's good and he's happy. And he's got 15 years of experience doing it now, God, you know? So it's like, yeah. he just found something that he liked and stuck with it and just worked his way up. To that's it. insane. I know. Yeah. I'm that's something weird to guy. think about, you know, like, yeah. Fi- oh yeah, it's been 15 years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He lives a block off the ocean in Venice. It's like, oh my God. It's like, dude, we were living in a, the shittiest, the <laughs> shittiest apartment in Hollywood, you know, the, the shittiest apartment in oh Hollywood. <laughs> well, I, cause, so I went to Fulton and yeah. uh, here's another oft repeated story on this podcast. I had a friend, Christine, who didn't graduate, uh, is a lawyer now, moved to Brooklyn, went, went from Knoxville to Memphis to Brooklyn, was up there for 10 years and she and I met up while I was up there. We're sitting at some bar in Brooklyn the, the last night I was in town. And I looked at her, I was like, did you ever think we'd be here right now? And she's like, not in a million years. Because yeah. two-thirds of our class, or is it two-thirds or three-quarters, are dead or in prison. I bet. Like, And, it, and I was like, what the f- Yeah. Yeah, we it made it out. a tough part of town back then. We made it out, man. And mm-hmm. yeah, I was sitting downtown in the city thing, and there was a guy, a law he, liaison between police officers and citizens and he was like oh yeah there were gangs that came out. i was like okay i wasn't making that shit up it was yeah. rough man it was it was pretty brutal when i was going to school there yeah man and uh but yeah her and i were just like never in a million years would expect us to be here like we would expect to be working at chick-fil-a or yeah. something you know we've got got friends of ours that they're happy to be a line cook at texas roadhouse yeah. god love them well and it it just helps to have some perspective and some gratitude you know yeah. that that uh, you, you did. You came from a tough spot, and yeah, look at but you yeah. now. <laughs> Shit, <laughs> sitting on a couch with extra pillows underneath to give a little <laughs> bit more support <laughs> for my big ass. Uh, man, fifteen years. Okay, so, and you still go out there and see him, and he comes yeah, back here and I work you. out there every now and then. So okay. I'll try to stay with him when I can. I officiated his wedding in Ohio. Nice. They got married about three or four years ago. Um, he and his lovely wife Megan, and nice. um go out there i'd probably work out there a couple times a year and i had a shootout in san diego last year that he came down for so we always we're always running into each other we've got trying to get him back here because we've got some tv shows that are um in development at pop fizz and um 
if we catch that if we catch that bus, we're going to need right. some people who know what the hell they're doing. And yeah. he and his wife both do. So, do they have kids? They just had a kid. Okay. L.A. is a hell of a place to raise a kid, man. Well, daycare is expensive here. I, I listen to a, <laughs> oh God. I listen to a ton of podcasts, and most of them are comedians. And hearing them talk, all of them talk about the L.A. housing market, and yeah. they're like, and a friend of mine, and him and his wife and his daughter just moved from outside of L.A. To Nashville, and they're like, "Oh man, Nashville's so cheap." Yeah, and I was like, "Never look at Knoxville. Yeah, it's yeah a quarter of yeah. what Nashville." They'll be like, is. "What kind of dump is that place?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, well, no, I was like, because they were talking about that's a big reason they moved. Yeah. she is a talent booker at Zany's Comedy Club. Oh, cool. And uh, but yeah, she but she was like, "I can't get over how cheap Nashville is." I was mm-hmm. like, "No, it's not. Yeah. It's not even close." Yeah. Well, like, to put it in perspective, the the place that my buddy Josh bought in venice was a thousand dollars a square foot jeez uh-huh 600 square foot oh apartment my six hundred thousand dollars good god almighty. not to tell tales out of school no. but that's just like a that's a oh yeah that's common yeah, that's a thing there's a comedian burt crasher that he was talking about how his house i'm trying to remember how much he said it was they got a super big deal but now excuse me they've renovated and he was like it's worth like three times as much as we paid for it it's stupid because man. the housing market has gone up so yeah. much where he's like this is like a 1.8 2 million dollar house yeah that we did not pay that for yeah you know it, it had it, la had just gone through a pretty big uh pretty big housing bubble kind of deal when i was out there and yeah. everything had kind of tripled in value in a couple oh years God. you know from the 90s coming into the aughts i think they hit a pretty good pretty good one there and rent was really expensive. And I was used to like, whatever, what'd you pay in the fort when I was yeah. in college? $300, $400 oh, yeah. a room. Yeah. You know, you weren't finding that <laughs> in LA. It was yeah. 900 bucks a month, no matter where you where you went. There was a point where I was looking at moving to either, cause, and I'm a dumbass for this, moving either San Francisco, London, or New York. Because why wow. not go whole hog? Yeah. And then I started looking at housing prices Stupid. or apartments. I was like, Stupid. you're out of your damn, I don't, it's like, I don't know how you would afford it. Yeah. Like as a, as a kid, yeah, <laughs> I was mean, like twenty. New York, uh, Manhattan, especially like home ownership is something that never even enters into people some people's no. f- sphere of consciousness. No, I'm just gonna rent an apartment for the rest of my life, and that's just that's cool. Yeah, I stayed in a friend's apartment, and I think it was two point three million dollars. Wow! And I just looked at it. I was like, this is like as big as maybe my living room and one bedroom. Yeah. And it's two point three million dollars. It's crazy. It's like you're at. What do you do for a living? Yeah. <laughs> like, how the fuck do you do this? Exactly. Like, yeah, I don't get it. Yeah, and then I look at like movie industry rates in Los Angeles. Like, yeah, certain positions on set, what people get paid, yeah. they get paid the same or less than they do here, yeah. mainly due to competition. There's so yeah. much competition out there. People looking for the same. You know, tons of camera operators, tons of camera yeah. assistants. Tons of art directors, they're everywhere. Um, but yeah, in, in a lot of cases, we pay better rates here. Like production assistants in Los Angeles, last time I was hiring them out there, were you know 150 bucks a day. And you can't Jeez. you can't get you can't get that here. No, it's 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 more than that. Well, that's what cracked me. Up. I've got friends who live in Jersey, and they paid like four hundred thousand dollars for their house. They're like, we got that for a steal. Yeah, and I was like, how much do you make? And they're like, oh. Fifty thousand dollars a year. I yeah, like, I, I have a yeah. Fuck. Is it a eighty year note on that <laughs> yeah. house? Yeah. How did you do? That? Yeah. Like, like I don't get that. Um, are the tax breaks still a huge thing in the film mm-hmm. TV? Yeah, they are. That's why Atlanta's killing it right now. Yeah, because I knew Ohio was huge for Were a while. They? So the 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 real big ones that I remember in in my career: Louisiana, North Carolina. I remember Georgia. North Carolina. Yeah, uh, uh, and. Um, so, North Carolina had the Wilmington thing yeah. during the '90s with One Tree Hill and all yeah. those kinds of things. They had studios out in, yeah. in Wilmington, and when North Carolina lost their tax incentives, it people moved, they yeah. migrated, they put their tent up in the next best tax incentive, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, state. And uh, I think that was Louisiana, maybe. And okay. Louisiana did did a bunch of. St- a bunch of stuff had their moment, and now Atlanta's just going crazy. A bunch of people work on Tyler Perry stuff. Tyler oh, Perry yeah. built a crazy and the Marvel studio. Studios yeah. stuff down there. Because mm-hmm. I know the first few Marvel films were shot in Cleveland, like the were first they? Captain America. Yeah, were all shot up there because they had huge tax incentives up there. Yeah, uh, 
that's always a weird thing for me because I remember there was one point where the state of Tennessee was looking at doing it, mm-hmm. and it got shot down. It's like, well, you had it's, it's when Haslam was in office. Yeah, you know his sister in law owned a production company. Oh yeah, that's true. And it didn't really benefit her. Yeah, to have tax incentives. I mean, I think what I heard or. I don't think I read this. I think this is completely anecdotal that I yeah. heard from somebody was that her stance on it was, you know, if the movies come to town and they pay these exorbitant rates for our freelance freelancers here, yeah. that takes away freelancers from my pool. Yeah. And then when that movie moves on to the next, to that movie leaves, like I'm responsible to then pay these people the rate, either the rate that they got on that yeah. movie or, you know, that it, it, and I understand that, Yeah. that, I understand that yeah. uh, that kind of stance on it um, because you know it it is it is a problem if somebody if somebody comes to Knoxville a production company comes to Knoxville and pays Jody Collins uh, five thousand dollars to film in his house yeah then when Pop Fizz comes to him and I need to direct something. Uh, and, and he, in your house, and here's your rate is five thousand dollars. Here's fifty bucks in a six pack. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd give you a hundred. <laughs> and a good six pack. And a, good, a good six, six pack. pack. Yeah, it'd, it'd be, be a mix six. <laughs> um, so, so it. So it, I think it is. Uh, it is a, a valid argument, but I think it pissed a lot of people off when. Yeah. When they took the stance on that, um, but. I don't know where that stands now. I would love to have it. Nashville would benefit a lot from it. I think. Yeah. Um, our, the way I see it, and I, I think I, I think I'm somewhat plugged into the freelance yeah. market here. We've got really, really great people here. Oh yeah, very great people here. Who work who can work anywhere. They can work. They can work in any big city uh, on a film set, and 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 they've got the chops to do yeah. it. But we've only got a few of those people. Yeah. So. I don't know that we could support a bunch of movies just coming to town. You know, they'd have to bring people. That, yeah. But that that bolsters your, you know, tourism. And and, and that's what the tax incentives are all about, yeah. right? Like, they're giving you 30% of your money back because you're booking 100 rooms in a hotel for three weeks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, I look at stuff, you know, it's, it's all about quality. Like, the two, let's see, there's... Three films, four, five films I know that were shot here that were from outside of here. Wait, no, no, four. Uh, October Sky. Yeah. Box of Moonlight. Uh, but then more recently, the Burt Reynolds movie. The yeah, last movie what star. That one's called. Last yeah, movie yeah, star. Yeah. And then that, evening that, evening, sun. that Evening Sun. Yeah. And you look at like That Evening Sun, it's a beautiful film. Like yeah. the way it's shot and yeah. everything is like. And then you look at some of the, and they're like, okay, they're okay, you know, whatever. But it's, yeah, if you if you get, there's people here. That Those can, were local people that worked on, yeah, on especially that evening sun. Yeah, that you look at it, it's like, no, it's it's there's quality everywhere. Yeah, like <laughs> we have some really great artists here. Like it's just, do you want to do that? Do you want to pay those people, mm-hmm. those quality people? Yeah, and uh, you know, there's. There's not a lot of competition in the in the industry here, um, but you know we the good ones are you know are, are freelancers, yeah. You know artists artists uh, and and technicians. Um, yeah. When they go to Atlanta, when they go to Nashville, when they go to Charlotte, and they work on bigger stuff, they yeah. always bring back some really great knowledge. Some new, they they see what the big boys yeah. are doing, and it makes us better. Yeah. You know. They're bringing tools and they're bringing new thoughts back yeah. with them and new approaches to to things. So it it helps us stay fresh too. And it's even like the Knoxville F- Film Festival with what Keith's doing. Like you see some of those seven day shootouts where it's Jupiter producing a short film. Like, yeah, it's good it's stuff. It's like holy shit, man! This, yeah, <laughs> I did it one year and I was like, I. I don't have a production house. It's me with the damn Nikon D7000, yeah. man. Yeah. It's like, that's all I got. <laughs> yeah. I see some guys. I don't do film festivals just because I don't have time right yeah. now. I yeah. might later, but um, I need my weekends and my nights and stuff for other things. But um, the seven day shootout was a lot. Of, it was, oh God, it was a nightmare and it was a lot of fun. And I got lucky in that everything fell through and I happened to have two friends that I could shoot a documentary on. Oh, that's cool. Because they had uh, 
bought an Airstream, spent a year fixing it up. I helped them fix it up and just happened that was their last weekend in town. I think I saw that. Yeah. Before they had it out of town. That was me. I think I saw that. That was me. Yeah. That's awesome. And it was crazy. It was like, because I kept trying to get actors and stuff and I was like, I couldn't get anybody to do the things, you know. Uh, There's still one idea that eventually I'm going to do it. I just got to find two guys and a girl. I'm just going to do it for me, just to get it out of me. What is it? Uh, Without giving away too much. I'll I'll tell you off mic. Okay, cool. That sounds (laughs) good. Because it is a weird idea that there is a twist, and I kind of want to keep that. Close to the vest? Yeah. It's that good. To where, do you know Shane, uh, shoot, he's a gaffer. He does. He bought a, a Sprinter van and he just filled it with light equipment and yeah, everything. That's cool. all he does. Shane Archer. I've I heard his name. name. Super nice guy. Yeah. Uh, but he's just like, no, I'm all in. This one will do. And he and I have talked about. It. He's like, whenever you're ready, I, I'm there. That's great. He's like, I just want to do it because because I told him the idea. He's like, holy shit, that would actually be kind of cool. I was like, okay, whenever I'm there, whenever I'm ready, yeah, I'll do it. Uh, I think he uh, gaffs a lot of stuff for uh, Adam Chapman. Yeah, and Adam Chapman stuff is really beautiful. I think I he does some stuff week. for Tyler Tyler Oxidon too. Yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, yeah. Because I guys, think I don't I don't know him, but uh, but I I've heard of him, of course. I think he helped with that Hot Sauce Holtzy video that they produced. Oh, cool. That uh, do you know him? Hot Sauce Holtzy. He's a uh-huh. UFC fighter that lives here. Oh yeah. He's a friend of mine. I've, I've, like I've, he's I've, awesome. Yeah. Like, is that his gym in Vestal? Or is that a different mm, MMA gym? No, he's out in, okay. at Shield Systems, Shields Academy, something like that in West okay. Knoxville. Okay. He's a Fountain City kid. Is he? Yeah, that now lives out west. But uh, yeah, he actually yesterday had lunch and he has a burger name for him at Inskip Grill. Heck yeah. And Kane does too. Heck yeah. And they had where they both showed up and it, he only... I'm going to fuss at Justin. He only gave an hour's notice. I have a burger named after me at Inskip Grill. I was like, damn it. I want to show up and be the three. I would be the arm in the photo that got cut off. It was like, yeah, <laughs> big guy, hot, you know, Kane, hot sauce, Holtzy. Who's what's that arm? Yeah. That's yeah. just poking in. I was like, oh, that's Jody. Yeah. That's, that's, that's me that he cropped out for his, for his profile. For, for the gram. For yeah. the gram. Yeah. Um, I want to get, uh, I want to get, uh, I want to talk to Glenn Jacobs. It's not hard. It's not. No, I want to talk to him. And it's funny because this came kind of out of one of the last ones I record here. I want to sit down with him and Ken Cannon. I have an idea for East Town Mall. Yeah. It's like it drone should... racing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, I think it needs to be, I think the city and the county should figure out a way to buy it together. Yeah. And it should be a multi use facility to where you can have one wing that. Jonathan Clark, courageous, said there's one in Jackson, Mississippi that they took over no mall. And now it's just uh, there's a doctor's office, there's chiropractor, there's eyeglass shop, there's two dentists. Like it's just all medical stuff, like a medical mall. And I was like, that could be one wing. I think since we're the maker city, there needs to be a section that's makers to Uh where like native maps, he needs a bigger print shop. He can take over one entire uh, store and just do that. They can have one store that's just for shipping and then have another store to sell their wares. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you, you reinvigorate the food court. You have once a week, you have people come up and perform. Uh, but the other thing I came up with is like, why in the hell is pop fizz or Jupiter or people not shooting? That could be a great production facility. Yeah. It you could take be. over where the old service merchandise was. Sure. Yeah. I, so I, I wonder I mean, brick and mortar is obviously struggle lugga lugga yeah. yeah. But how come West Town Mall still seems to be somewhat thriving? Is it not? It's not. It's not. They just tore down the Sears. Did Oh, that's right. It. Well, that was disconnected, wasn't it? No. Was it? I thought it was part of it. Was it? Okay. I think but no, I think uh the weird factoid is JC Penny closed at East Town Mall. JC Penny closed at West Town Mall. Yeah. The Top five J.C. Penney store in the country is at freaking Turkey Creek. Really? Yeah, which is a weird fact. So you lose your anchor tenant, and it just yeah. kind of sends you downhill. I think West Town's not doing as good. I think they're trying with like that Cinnabar. To Do keep... they have? I mean, I haven't noticed a bunch of like vacant, um, v- vacant. Store I don't think fronts. there's a lot of vacant. I think there's a lot of cheap tenants now. Really? 
I, it's I just think, they, they just their price per square foot yeah. just dropped yeah. drastically. And I think you got stuff like the Apple Store. Mm-hmm. I think you got some people that will never move out there until they shut it down. Yeah, I've I've got a buddy who had a great idea. Uh, he he's he came from retail um, retail background, and he's been watching the stuff with with malls, especially yeah. Westfield and Simon and all that. That are yeah. just really I think they're the two biggest kind of yeah nationally maybe, but they're struggling. They, oh, yeah. they, they're having trouble getting tenants. They're having trouble getting you know, yeah. people in the door. And it's like, how do we get kids to come to the mall and be mall rats like they used to be? Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's AR maybe. Oh yeah. You know, make a Pokemon See, go game out of it. Yeah, They'll show yeah. up. <laughs> Good God. You know, find the sun sphere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I mean, I thought it was an in, in, interesting an thought interesting of like how thing. to, yeah. how to, step into 2020 how to get get the kids out of their yeah because to them you know i'm at my house you're at your house but we're both playing call of duty talking to each other on the headset we're hanging out yeah you know yeah that that suffices these days they've got the one place it was service merchandise then it was like gold's gym and then it turned into some kind of something like that to where it was like two levels of being able to do things, but it was the East Town Mall name is so tarnished, yeah. which drives me nuts because I'm like, it's it, it was never as bad as everybody thought it was. Like, yeah, everybody just crapped on because it, it had East in the name. Yeah, uh, that's still one of the best was one of the best theaters in town. I, I remember seeing Three Ninjas there when I was nine years old, man, or uh, younger. I don't know, seven. I think I saw my first R-rated film there in <sighs> Speed. Nice, and I think I was underage when I saw that, but I was so big they were just like, "Yeah, come yeah. on in, yeah, come on in." Speed is a fantastic movie. It's free on uh, like the Vizio watch. Is uh, it really? thing right now? I almost watched it the other day. I was like, "Man, Keanu Reeves looks so young." I know he's he's never. All right, so where do you okay? I'm going down the rabbit hole. Where do you stand on John Wick movies, man? I don't know. Okay, so my problem. Yeah, everybody thinks I am a movie buff because oh. I work in the film and television industry, and I'm not. Oh like my. I like what I like, and I yeah. like films. But um, man, I watch commercials. Uh, <laughs> and, like I like to me, I of course love a good movie. Yeah, but I'm just not as big of a film buff as I should okay. be. I wish I was. Okay, do you, I need to leave? No, I'm going <laughs> to flip this. So, what did you think of the Bill Murray commercial during the Super Bowl? Did you see it, the Jeep commercial? Yes, I did. Where they redid Groundhog's Day. Yes, I did. That's one of the best yes, commercials of the last 10 yes, years. Yes, Like, that That was insane. Like, yeah, we were, because it, it was a couple days after Groundhog Day, right? Yeah. No, it was Groundhog Day. It was on Groundhog Day. Yeah. Oh, perfect. It was genius. It was yeah, genius. Yeah, it was. Yeah. But my buddy, we had, I forget what we were doing earlier that day, he put, I got you, babe, on, and he was yeah. like... Today's the day. It was like, <laughs> it's like right. Groundhog Day. <laughs> that that com- that was great. Yes, thanks for thanks for <laughs> digging that up for me. That was great. Uh, it was funny because somebody said whatever they paid him, it was worth it. Yeah, and then I saw behind the scenes, and he said, uh, "He's like, it was the end. You could tell he had just had a joy the entire time. He sure. loved it so much. And at the end, he he addressed everybody. He's like, thanks everybody for doing this. Thanks for everybody for being on my first." And last commercial ever. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, that is his first commercial ever. Yeah. I was like, that's amazing. Uh-huh. Like, and I was like, oh Never my had God, to do him. This is whatever they paid yeah. to get him. Does was, he live in Charleston still? Do you know? He bounces back and forth from Does what he? I understand. Because he's got a son that owns a bar in Brooklyn okay. that I know he's up there a lot where he'll just decide to show up. Doesn't he own the minor league baseball team in Charleston too? He co-owns, yes. Co-owns it? And he'll just show up. And oh, I... Uh, there's many a time where I've been like, I really want to go just, to, but then I think he's one of those that he doesn't like to be bothered and yeah. all that. But you see him like pop up photo bombing people's yeah. bachelor parties. And oh stuff. yeah. <laughs> the one crazy where was, Bill they were shooting to... uh, engagement photos and he just showed up and yeah. sat. I was like, there's a documentary on Netflix about it, about the Bill Murray stories where they interviewed those people about him just showing up. That's fantastic. And then the guy ends up seeing him at, Charleston at the baseball game and he's like I couldn't do it like I think he went up and said hi to him but he's like I can't ask him to be in my film right I was like God damn it I was like yeah I get that that's nice yeah but he saw it's classy yeah not, not bother the guy I 
I don't know. I've got friends that have said like one of them worked in Tribeca and Robert De Niro. Mm -hmm. His office was in her office building and they got on the elevator together and she's like, I didn't say anything to him because you don't say anything. I was like, I would still say good morning. Yeah. Like, yeah. You don't say that in New York either. (laughs) Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. I look people and I go, Hey, how's it going? And they're like, what the the hell's wrong with that guy? He's going to kill everyone. Exactly. (laughs) Did you see that beard? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I, uh, this happened, uh, right around Thanksgiving. I recommended a cigar to Charles Barkley. Nice. Atlanta. I, he came in. It wasn't a big, terrible, stupid one, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. No. <laughs> Good. He, he came in and I saw him and my buddy was sitting across from me. I was like, oh shit, that's Charles Barkley. He's like, that's not Charles. Holy shit. That is Charles Barkley. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and he, he went back to the human door and my buddy's like, you have to go back there. You have to go back there. You have to go back there. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay, okay. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. And I got up and I went back there and I walked in and he did a double take cause I'm two inches taller than him. I bet. Yeah. He doesn't <laughs> see a lot of guys bigger than him. <laughs> he was like, how are we doing today, man? He was super nice. And I was like, doing good, doing good. And he's like, good to hear, good to hear. And then he's like, tell me more about this to the guy in there. Yeah. And he was like, well, this is this, this, and this. I was like, if you're looking for a good one, I just smoked this one, and it's amazing. He was like, oh, which one was that? And he came over. I was like, it's that one right there. It's the most expensive cigar in there. <laughs> and I was just like, did I get a commission or something? Come on, split like, that commission. And uh, he was like, good. He was like, good. Thank you. Like that and picked it up. And he was like, all right, have a good one. Is that your biggest run in with a celebrity? Uh, uh, Tom Cruise and I have nodded at one another. You've nodded at one? Just like, I see you. He's very short. I bet. He, is very, he came heard. to a premiere out at uh, Pinnacle. Oh, yeah. And I I went because I was like, fuck, I got to go to this. Mm-hmm. He, uh, there was a line, or not a line, but like a rope to where everybody could go up and he was shaking people's hands and stuff. And there was a guy who's kind of being a dick and pushed a little girl out of the way. Aww, yeah. That's terrible. Who was standing in that line. So I just reached up and grabbed him by the arm and pushed him over. <laughs> Good for you. Right as Tom Cruise came up and he saw the little girl, he kind of saw that happening and he kind of nodded at me. He's he like, like, hey man. It's game like respecting that. game right yeah. there. <laughs> he was like, Jesus Christ, that's a big motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he signed her autograph or something and just went on. I was like, I'm Aww. good. That's yeah. all I need. Yeah. He's probably the biggest. Yeah. I don't know. A lot of musicians, a lot of comedians. Yeah. I've hung I've hung out with or but he's he Tom Cruise is the biggest. Charles Barkley's pretty damn close, man. Yeah. Charles everybody loves Charles Barkley, man. Yeah. It's hard not to. Yeah. Anybody with a golf swing like that, oh you know. Oh my god. <laughs> he's the funniest mother Oh my god. Him and Shaq he on is. that damn show. I know, man. They about they make each other about cry. Oh my god. Laughing so hard. How about you? How's the big what's the biggest Oh, man, I'd have to think about it because living in L.A., I saw people all the time. Yeah. And I was like, oh, is that Heather Locklear? Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh somebody God. like that. Of all the names to pull. Uh, well, that, that was the first one I saw. Oh so I, rem- I remember that was a like, hell of a one to oh, see. Too. At the coffee bean in Beverly yeah. Hills. <laughs> it's like, holy shit. I, I don't know. Like it, Working for working, doing the uh, HGTV and DIY promos that I shot for five or six years uh, ended up with a bunch of B-list celebrities. I've got yeah. a, I've got. I've got a picture uh, on my fridge uh, uh, of Mr. T with me in a headlock. <gasps> so that was that's I, I, I would yeah that was pretty cool. Yeah, had to do it. Um, but I think I think uh, I have to I'll have to think about that. You, I'll you, let you know. Then you'll like this. So I had shot a little thing for Visit Knoxville. I went to Fanboy and got people to say how much they love the city. And uh, Lou Ferrigno. Oh yeah. Kevin Sorbo, who's super nice. Who's that? It, uh, Hercules. Oh, okay. So, so you Shane, got all the big boys. He's kind of a trumper. Oh, which is bummer. C. Thomas Howe, which was wild. He was super nice. Uh, Pony Boy from The Outsiders. He was big in the 80s. Okay, I don't and know. And he's been on stuff now. Uh, the guy who plays the new Darth Vader, who's bigger than me. Oh, yeah. Um, Ryan, shoot, Bertier from... Remember the Titans, but he's on Sons of Anarchy. He was almost as big. Like, it was all big dudes. <laughs> I don't know why. And then there was one point where there were two booths, and it was Ralph Macchio and Johnny. I can't pull his name right now from the Karate Kid. Oh, yeah. And that's awesome. We went up, and he was signing autographs, and the guy that runs the thing yeah. went up to his assistant and said, 
hey, he's doing this. Can he just talk for 10 seconds and he's going to film it just on his phone? Super easy. And the assistant said, he's not into that. And he was like, oh, oh, okay. So we walked yeah. away. And Ralph Macchio was not there. He's like, I'm pissed because Ralph was talking about how much he loved Knoxville. Yeah. And he's not here. I found out later the dude would have totally done it. It was his assistant being yeah. a dickhead. Being a gatekeeper. But yeah. the last one, the one you might like, the one that I had a little bit of a hard time talking to was Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Oh, man. You got to meet him? Like <laughs> he you was got, in Nashville. You got nervous about Yes. Yeah, Because I had a foam thumb when I was a kid, Oh, I man. bet you did. I was so excited. I was like, that's Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Holy shit. Yeah. Holy shit, that's Hacksaw Jim Duggan. He was like, right. He was going out right as I was coming in to, he to wrestling. He to my damn phone. I was like, oh, my God. That's awesome. <laughs> like, I was flipping the shit out, man. All right. I, I thought about it. Okay. I, w- I was... Um, when I was in LA, I did get one acting gig. Okay. And I was an extra in a scene with Chevy Chase. Holy shit. And uh, it was a therapy scene in a movie called Funny Money. Oh yeah. Uh, and if you watch the if you watch the therapy scene, you might recognize me. Okay. I was I I showed it to the people at work the other day and uh they were like, "That guy looks like Eminem." <laughs> oh my god. I was like, "That's me." Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! Uh, and then we, we did uh, we did a show for uh, the the production company I work for started the show Gene Simmons Family Jewels. So Jesus. yeah, so spent some time uh, at Gene Simmons' house shooting the pilot for that, and met him and Shannon Tweed and their kids and, and all that. Nick, yeah. yeah, Nick and Sophie were really young then. Um, Nick is super tall too. Nick is real tall. Yeah. How's he doing in his music industry? In his music biz- business? No yeah, I don't. I don't know either. I remember. <laughs> uh, I've heard horror stories about Gene Simmons. He was pretty much a dick. Yeah, pretty much. But yeah. like, yeah, pretty much. On that show, Shannon, tw- her and the she kids was terrible. Act- oh, was she? Yeah. The rest of them came off like gold Angel- because, angels, I guess, because he was yeah. such a dickhead. Yeah. Um, it was, and, and that's limited experience yeah. with, with me. I mean, I think they split up, didn't they? Gene Simmons and Shannon Tweed know. after being together for like almost 30 years. I think they were also never married. They were. They're were happily unmarried. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is God, what they said. Damn. Yeah. Screw yeah. them. Was Chevy Chase nice or, cause he's another one that's got bad stories. Yeah. He, Gene Simmons was a little nicer. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> I mean, Chevy was good. Like what I, I talked to him uh, during the scene during, in between takes, we talked yeah. a little bit. He was complimenting my shoes, told me a story about his reindeer shoes that he had that were made out of reindeer. Oh Jesus. Um, but I, I actually, I had a couple interactions with him because we screened that movie together a couple times Okay, and he had the same, he came into the screening at the conference room at our production company and, it's like, can anyone tell I have an erection? And, you know, sat down. Everybody was like, that's weird. <laughs> and and then uh, we did another screening like a month later. And, you know, he walks in. Can anybody tell I have an erection? And sat down. We're like, dude, oh, you, that's is that your joke? That's, that's the your joke. One joke. That's your yeah. one joke. Hey, that was 2004, man. Oh, my God. So, you yeah, know, not 2020. You can't do that now. But um, You said B-less celebrities. I've always heard Vanilla Ice was yeah. the nicest guy in the world. He really is a nice guy. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've shot with him like... I've shot with him about a half a dozen times, both he, both in Knoxville, down at his a couple of his different houses in, uh, like near uh, for, uh, West Palm Beach, yeah. in Florida. Yeah, uh, he remodeled a couple mansions. He buys mansions on tax liens. Yeah, and, and remodels them and sells them. And you know what a guy! He wrote one song when he was 16 years old, yeah. and he's still got some money. MC Hammer's broke as shit. Yeah, uh, Vanilla Ice is still doing all right. You know the. The story I heard about him when it was still Scripps Networks was I had friends that worked out there and they said they were just sitting there. They, they said this happened multiple times where they just sitting in his cubicle and all of a sudden they heard a knock on their cubicle and turned around as vanilla fucking eyes. Mm-hmm. And he said, hey, man, I just want to thank you for everything you're doing for me. Yeah. There. Like they were like, he could not be more humble. Yeah. And I, I saw him on his heavy metal tour face at Moose's Music Hall. Oh, really? And he, the last thing he said before he started Ice Ice Baby, the heavy metal version, <laughs> was, um, hey, guys, I'm going to be in the back. This was like 1997, 1998. He was like, I'm going to be in the back. If you want a photo, you want me to sign anything, I'll that's be great. here until everybody's gone. What a gracious guy. Like, I was like, holy shit, man. Yeah. Like, that's amazing. Like, 
so we we did a still photography shoot at, at one of his houses in West Palm Beach one time, and it was supposed to be kind of a sunset shot, mm-hmm. and he was just getting off a plane from LA, and he and he was late by like three hours. Yeah. It ended up being a dark a dark shot. It ended yeah. up being yeah. you know after dark by the time he got there, just because you know travel plans and all that but he showed up we were just supposed to get the one shot film an interview with him and then be on our way but we uh after we were done with the interview it was like 11 o'clock or midnight he's like you guys want to hang out watch a movie i'm like yeah so we went (laughs) so we went to the theater yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) i actually forget what we watch I, i i'll remember it later i'm sure but he he ordered a couple pizzas and we sat in his theater room and watched That's movies amazing. and chatted and it was super fun and and uh i was talking to him about um i was like man i you know i think my favorite song that i that i remember of yours is the bloodhound gang song yeah was, oh yeah as we dropped this bomb blew yeah up this place oh, like yeah. another vietnam and we both started singing it together and oh like, my god and they're like a tyson blow to the dome back up son give me room give me room <laughs> <laughs> and that was like that was a highlight of my life yeah. to have like a you know uh like i idolized the guy when oh, i was yeah. when i was six years old oh yeah and then to be eating pizza and and in his and rapping one of his songs with him <laughs> was really really fun i'm sure he's just happy not to hear ninja rap i bet he is too <laughs> go ninja go ninja go <laughs> i forgot about the book i think the bloodhound gang is what started him on the heavy metal kind of phase probably so yeah uh oh my god i almost forgot about that holy shit yeah, yeah. that was a lot of that was a lot of fun <laughs> yeah the other uh so one of my favorite comedians had a show on travel forever Bert Kreischer oh, Hurt cool. Bert and Trip Flip were the two shows but you said mainly HGTV and food and DIY oh, so DIY. yeah um so like the Property Brothers I've shot with them half a dozen Is times where too. Chip and Joanna Gaines are from uh they're they are from Waco I've met them too and I've yeah. told this story on the podcast but they're on HGE or DIY uh-huh. or something. well yeah they are they are na- they are starting their own network Magnolia Network okay. launches in October so uh, I think the story there is that they were about to boogie from HGTV cancel their show and all that and it's like well what about a network yeah it, can we hang on to them then because I think they've been they kind of came out of nowhere and became and became cash cows pretty much immediately I I not to, I have a blog. I, I'm redoing my website and I'm launching a blog that Hasib named and he called it the No Bullshit Designer. No, oh, cool. That's the name of it. But one of them, the title is, I don't know who Chip and Joanna Gaines are and that's okay. <laughs> because it's, because everybody may, I'm in these groups where everybody makes such a big deal about them. I was like, yeah. I don't, I know Shiplap. That's all yeah. I know, man. I was like, that's okay that I don't know who the hell they are. It's okay to not follow trends, man. I mean, I think she, uh, I could be wrong, but I think they found her from a blog, her Magnolia okay. design blog, I think. Um, and we we shot a promo with them before they had ever even, I think, shot the first episode of their show. Wow. So okay. we, we worked with them pretty early on and then um, went back a couple times after they got, after they got famous. And I, to me, they were the same gracious, same kind people. people yeah. Um, after being, you know. Well, yeah. they're from household names. They're from Waco. <laughs> yeah, they uh, and and to them, I think Chip said this once. He was like, you know, our our town that we love so much has it's taken a long time for people to forget about, yeah. you know, David Koresh and all that stuff. Yeah. And he didn't say it by name, but you yeah. know, the Branch Davidians or whatever. Yeah. And, and you know, he said, we we're doing we're going to stay here because we want Waco to have a you know have a that's amazing. a reputation healing yeah <laughs> that's amazing yeah, yeah. uh that's they, how i feel like knoxville used to be the opposite of that people would leave mm-hmm. but now i feel like a lot of people are like no this is my home yeah. this is where i want to be i love it here yeah it's um i feel fortunate that you know creatives like you and i can have uh decent jobs yeah and civilized lifestyles i'm not yeah. spending two hours in my car driving to work every day I'm not jumping on a subway that takes an hour where i might you know yeah. knocked over or robbed or whatever yeah. you know it's like it's it's pretty it's it's a good meet me in the middle kind of place you know it's yeah i, I really dig it 
We've got we, family here, too. We have porches and know how to use them. That's <laughs> damn right. Park Ridge, man. I lived in Park Ridge for five years, and I'll tell you what, the porch parties, <laughs> epic. Well, it's wild because I had a contract gig way out on, on Dutchtown. Mm-hmm. In the drive that's a here. fun part of East Nashville. <laughs> that's what yeah. we call it too. Yeah. Like yeah. I just like there were days I get so angry. It's like, why is this taking me forty five minutes to an hour to get out there or get home? Yeah. It's like this is stupid. And then I was like, Holy shit, this is some people's every day. Yeah. In Nashville. Yeah, I bitch about my twenty two minute drive to work all the time. Like, Harden oh. Valley or whatever, but it could be so much worse. Yeah. Uh okay, so you're out in LA, mm-hmm. you're doing the PA, you're also are you still taking improv classes while you're doing the PA gig? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you're still doing, and you're taking classes at yep. the school mm-hmm. and kind of doing that. So what, what was the next big thing? Like, did you move up in the PA world or you got No, full-time? I kind of, I, LA was, LA was tough for me. I mean, I was 19 years old, 20 yeah. years old at the time. I I wasn't making any money. I didn't have anybody out there that could catch me if I fell, you know, either. So I just, I, I noticed that it was, it was, it was time to, it was time to get better at the film business if I wanted to stay in it because I couldn't have, I I could have been a PA at that production company forever. Um, And so were you auditioning a lot for commercials or anything? No, I I didn't have time. I mean, I was Everybody out there works so hard, it seems like. Yeah. You know, it's like 9 o'clock in, in the morning until 7.30 at night were our office hours. And, yeah. You know, you want to blow off some steam after that, but you can't. So you got yeah. time on the weekends to go to the beach and stuff. So I, I really just kind of said, I'm going to put the acting thing on hold for now. I'm having fun with the work that I'm doing. Yeah. But I want to get better at this kind of work. Yeah. And so. And did you kind of soak it up and learn from people? Like camera yeah. operators and not, I mean, not really because I was so much of just like an office PA, like a runner, you know, okay. for the, for the production company. And, and so I didn't get to spend as much time on set as I wanted to. And I, I knew that I love the production world. I just didn't know where I wanted to fit into it. Yeah. And I mean, I think all the way, all the way up until, all the way up until I started film school in South Carolina, I, I kept thinking that it was going to be the back door that I got into acting yeah. from. And I just, I lost interest in acting uh, yeah. and really gravitated towards cinematography and directing. And so. But it, do you feel like because you had that experience, you treat actors differently? Mm-hmm. Cause you're, it, yeah. I mean, I, I think you always hear like the term players coach with yeah. sports. Yeah. And that's kind of how I'm, I'm probably an actor's director. You okay. Know? Yeah. I, um, I probably lean more towards that than I, than I, do the like camera storytelling yeah. kind of part of it. The performance for me is powerful. Getting people into head spaces, helping them tell the story. Um, is, I'm trying is to remember who jam. was uh, some big director saying that they thought everyone should switch. Like every yeah. director should act yeah. for a little bit and every actor should try and direct mm-hmm. for a little bit. So they understand a little bit more of that balance. Yeah. I mean, one of probably my, my favorite director right now, uh, and like I said, I'm not a movie buff. Brent but Ratner. What? Brent Ratner. No. Uh, Michael Bay. No. <laughs> I'm trying to think of awful directors. <laughs> Ron Howard, man. Ron uh, Howard's and pretty great. I I like what I like what he's. I like I like how he communicates with his talent. I've yeah. Did that, um, yeah, I've done his did his master class. I've heard it's yeah. one of the best master classes yeah. on storytelling it's amazing. that you can ever take. It's it's really great. And yeah. um he just makes a lot of sense to me. And and I was a I, I was really a fan of his before that. Yeah. Um Arrested Development is my favorite thing of all time. Uh, <laughs> uh but I, I was always a huge fan of, of any of anything that he did. But after that master class, I was like, Yeah, man, he's yeah. He's he's got the chops. I'll never have those, but man, it's good to learn from him. It's amazing. I feel like there's a guy, and he's been around for twenty years at this point. But there's a guy that's I feel like kind of like Ron Howard. James Mangold is kind of like a Ron yeah. Howard type that he does all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, that's off. what's he done? Uh, he did. So the bigger things he'd be known for is he did Copland, the remake of Three Ten to Yuma. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did the Wolverine and Logan, 
and he just did Ford versus Ferrari. Okay. So he's and I'm I'm missing some in there. I know there's was that one Kate and Leopold with Hugh Jackman and Meg Ryan, but his like Kate and Leopold is a weird fantastical romance. Yeah. Ford versus Ferrari is you know essentially a story of two men and racing. So and he's then, got some range. Yeah. Then Logan, where I feel like yeah. the same way with Ron Howard, like. You have like Apollo thirteen, Apollo thirteen, <laughs> but then you go back to like Splash or not. One of my favorite films of his is Night Shift. Yeah, Night Shift is Michael Keaton in Night Shift is one of the funniest. Yeah, from where he breaks down. Have you ever seen Night Shift? Uh, no. It's him and Henry Winkler, the Fonz, <laughs> and they're running a. They're working in a what's it called? A cop dead body. They go to the morgue. Yeah, the morgue. Yeah. They start running a prostitution ring out of the morgue. <laughs> and there's a point where Michael Keaton does this speech where he's breaking down the term prostitution. And it's like two minutes long. Is it a it's great one of the monologue? Funniest things. He's like, So you got pro. <laughs> and then you, you got statute. Well, we'll just not mark that out. And you got shunt. Like, it's just the funniest. Part. But that, I think that was his first film, was not a uh, night shift. Was it a Roger Corman thing? Oh no, that's right. He did a couple. He did a few Roger Corman films before that. Yeah, but are, yeah, and then you go into Apollo thirteen, and then you go into Cinderella uh, Man. Cinderella Man, and what the the one with uh, Frost Nixon. Yeah, which was I was like, holy shit, this yeah. is a great like snapshot of yeah, like time. Yeah, I oh, I had to start saying my my favorite director is Ron Howard because you know we can't say Woody Allen anymore, so. <laughs> well you can oh, yeah you might get spit on <laughs> yeah you might but i was always a really big fan of his work um yeah. you know personal stuff aside yeah you know I, I i don't condone anything like that but yeah. or what he's accused of but um i i do um i think that the longevity of that kind of guy to come out with a film every single year since 1965 is pretty fucking amazing and the variance like if you go from like was it Midnight in Paris, but then go back to yeah. like Match Point? Sure. Like Match Point's a super tense film mm -hmm. that you would never think. Like, it, there's range there too. Yeah. But I th yeah, I think his I think his writing has always has always really been great. I think his storytelling, um, the simplicity of it, has really always yeah. appealed to me. Um, and almost like the idiosyncratic kind of main character. Yeah. I, 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 I like I like that in in, in his films, but. Um, yeah, I've, 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 I've not been following his, his career a lot lately, but I know that he, he, he's, he had 40 good years where if you look, he released a, a film every single year yeah. and they all did well at the box office Yeah, and, you know, critically, whatever, he's probably blackballed, but yeah, but now I'm trying to think, why in the hell can I not pull his name? The guy did mash, uh, Roger shit. No, that's not right. Did Mash? I should have never challenged you to a film buff off. Robert uh, <laughs> Robert Altman. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. He did Mash, but his style were like he did uh, film in the nineties. The the circle, the table in New York, the Algonquin Round Table. It was about those people, but he just, from a technical standpoint, he mic'd every single person. And somebody oh, yeah. just sat in the back with a fader, yeah, and would turn people up and down. So you could oh, hear that's cool. bits of conversation. That's really cool. Like, and that's what he did. Like, uh, he did a Philip Marlowe book, the old Humphrey Bogart. He did one called "The Long Goodbye" with Elliot Gould. Yeah, I've, and I've it's heard of that. Unbelievable. Like, and it, but it's like Elliot Gould will be walking in, and you're inside his apartment, and you're already hearing him talking, but you're also hearing the neighbors who got music playing. Like, it's all yeah. this crazy, like technical shit. Yeah, that I like when people take chances and do new stuff. Like, yeah. I'm. I'm really good at ripping other people off, but like, I think when you can come up with your own style and yeah. do your own thing, that's what's really that's what's really special, and do it with confidence. Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think about that a lot in design. I was like, I want to do something. It's like I don't I don't want to just copy off a of Draplin or you know one of the bigger people. It's yeah. like everybody else is doing that. I don't want to do that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's um that's something that I've like even with my podcasts. Like I've. I, I'm really, sh I, I'm really struggling to 
make it something that is um, different than right. is out there. And I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel by any means, but I also don't want to just copy the no. podcasts that I like and listen to. Yeah. But, you know, and like in, in some ways too, like Greta Van Fleet sounds like Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Because they influenced them. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's part yeah. of that too. What is it? Good artists borrow, great artists steal, steal. or something yeah. like that. It's, it's like, a, I don't uh, want to get into that territory, but like... I can never remember the beginning of this. It's the sincerest form of flattery. Yeah. Imitation? Uh, imitation. So a friend of mine, Mark, said, imitation is the sincerest form of fucking stealing. Yeah. It, like, it really I is. Like, I, I love yeah. that so much. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I, I think you learn the, you learn your medium, you know, you know the rules, and then you figure out which ones you can break. And make well, there's style. always there's always rap music, you know. <laughs> you take this, this, and this, and you make it better than it ever was. Yeah. You take fifty different elements, and you got the Wu Tang Clan. Like yeah. Like there's something to be said of oh no, I'm going to learn from everybody. Yeah. And and the thing out at PetSafe, their motto was try a lot of things and keep what works. That's great. It's like that's a great way of living. Sure. Like. Yeah, I'm going to be open to anything and try everything, yeah. but I'm going to figure out what works really well, and that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Well, okay, so you're you're out where there. Where am I now? You're, Have I moved back yet? No, you're about to. So did you move back here and then go to film school? or yes. did you? Okay. I did. So did you take some time here to kind of reset? And, yeah. I. Uh, do you know the name Bobby Drennan? I lived on Bobby Drennan's farm for two years. Really? Yeah. Wait, okay, hold on. Uh-huh. What year did you graduate from Bearden? I uh, graduated from Bearden in 2003. I moved to L.A. in 2004. I moved back to Morristown, to Bobby's Farm in 2006. I was there in 06 and 07. And I'm then, trying to figure out if you know my old roommate. Maybe. Candace Brown. The name sounds familiar. So she went to Bearden. I can't remember what yes. year, year yes. she would have graduated. No, no, no. I know, I, I know Candace Brown. Yes. But then I do. She, I know uh, uh, her brother it was a great friend of mine in high yeah. school. Scott. Okay. If so, we're talking about the same. Yeah. Yeah. So she uh, dated a guy who lived in Morristown who was close to Bobby Drennan. So okay. they would end up at his place a lot. Joel. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the guitar dude player that was from in Melatonin. Vertigo. Vertigo yeah. and Melatonin. I know Joel. So I I'm, met him up at Bobby's. I know that that oh, group cool. too. Like I'm yeah. close with Lindsay and her brother. Yeah. Stamey. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So they would end up at Bobby. And also in the 70s, my mom went and got read by Bobby Drake. Yeah, my and, mom did too. And still has it on audio cassette yeah. somewhere at the house. Yeah. So, okay. So you moved back. And yeah, I, I, I ran his farm for two years. Holy shit. Working on horses and cleaning yeah. the horse stalls. Is he still alive? No, he died. Um... He died about three years ago. Okay. He had cancer. Oh, man. Yeah. That's a, yeah. To, it took him quick. It was very sad. But he was, he was up there in age, was he not? Uh, he was born in 54, 55. Okay, so he's younger he, he than was, I thought he was. Yeah, he okay. was like six, he was 63 when he died, <sighs> I think. Fucking cancer. I know, man. And it's, it's really sad. But you know what? That man helped more people. Yeah. Than probably anybody I know. And lived 20 different lives. Yeah, he did. (laughs) Yeah. Also lived life his way for, what, 40 of those years? Absolutely. As as an outcast. Yeah. (laughs) You know, in some some ways. Uh, Okay, so you moved. How did you hook up with him? My parents knew him. Oh, okay. So they introduced me. I'd known him. I'd known him a long time. I went and saw him when I was like 14 or 15. And then... um, kept in touch with him over the years and then kept in touch with him when I was in LA. Yeah. And then, um, when, when it was time to come back, I was like, I don't really want to stay with my parents. He was like, well, my farm guy's quitting. You can work, you can, you can work on the farm if you want to. And then work on your head, Yeah, (laughs) work on your head space (laughs) too. And so that was actually really like really helpful. Yeah. I mean, very helpful to, to have, you know, a counselor like that, yeah, to to help you transition from a mind fuck that is Los Angeles as a nineteen and twenty year old, and to be able to come into that uh, ex- experimental uh, yeah. uh, decade of my life, right? <laughs> um, and to also probably not have a okay, you need to be out by this time. You know, not a governor on yeah. there, just like no. Whenever no. you're feeling right, you're you can move on. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. I mean, he his his thing was you know. 
get the uh, get the lesson or repeat the classroom. You know, your life is a series oh, of, of okay. classrooms, and you get to go to the next one after you after you get the lesson that this classroom has taught you. Um, and so, I, I mean, I use that every day. I think about him every day, man, because he uh, he really he, he's he's helped a lot of people. Yeah, but he he helped me a lot, man. He, yeah, he yeah really did. That's wild. Yeah. I hadn't heard that name in forever. Yeah. Probably since Candace and uh, Joel talked about it. Um, like I hadn't yeah. heard that name since right around that time. Yeah. Would have been mid 2000s. Yeah. Um, so um, his son uh, worked in Knoxville and when the farm stuff was, was I, I think it got to be winter and didn't need as much stuff done on the farm. Yeah. Started working with his son. That brought me back to Knoxville. Moved back to Knoxville. Uh, doing home home uh, home theater rooms, man. Designing Holy home shit. theater rooms and installing them. Oh my god! With Bobby's son, and um, and that's when I decided, you know, I can be a, a low voltage home theater technician for the rest of my life, or I can follow my production stuff yeah. that I've already got some experience in. And that's when I decided to go to film school. Was after that at the film school? This may be a dumb question, uh, and. No. God, I hope this does not sound condescending. That's no. not what I mean. Could anybody go, or was it good that you went in being like, hey, I already did this? Like, does that make sense? I was like, definitely the most experienced person there, but yeah, yeah, you could you could pay to play. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure how that worked, like if, because I know some of them are like, we're just going to come in and show you just technical, well, not not like theory and stuff like I, that. I don't, I don't know for sure that yeah. anybody could have gotten in, but I'd already been accepted to Blue Ridge Motion Pictures. Okay. So they honored that. Okay. Um, so Man. we went down and interviewed with, with them in Greenville and um, found, uh, stayed, stayed at my aunt and uncle's house in Traveler's Rest, uh, oh, South Carolina, nice. in a tent in their backyard <laughs> for a month while I was looking for an Holy apartment. Shit. Yeah. And um, found a roommate that I met at film school yeah and we needed a third roommate to get our rent down so uh went on craigslist <laughs> found a roommate on craigslist named james sifford and uh i was a groomsman in his wedding when he got Holy married shit. so we all became we all became real tight that's a so, yeah uh, all from craigslist <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly. from craigslist to groomsman he was a groomsman in my wedding too oh my We're, God. we became we became great friends but greenville was a really great place i waited tables and bartended while i lived there so that was, that was, I was 24, 25 years old. So I was a little older. I, yeah. I'd had the, you know, I'd, I'd had the, uh, Bobby Drennan wisdom bomb dropped oh, on me. Yeah. So I was a little, a little further along in life. You didn't walk around me like, now when I was in LA. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I didn't. <laughs> and I, and I can't it, imagine you do it. Yeah. <laughs> I still try to stay away from that. Yeah. I just did my time out there like anybody else does. And yeah. I'm glad I did because, um, I think I think right now, you know, if I wouldn't have done it, I would have wondered if I should have. Yeah. Or if I should. Yeah. And now I know I'm good with our little town, with fa yeah. with family all around. Oh, man. You know? Porches. And the porches. The porches are great. Love the porches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, going to school. Yeah. Uh, was there any sort of focus there? Like, yeah, I'm going to... Directing and production management. Okay. So there you go. There was there was the uh, from you could choose a path and for me it was it was directing it was telling a story with the camera and the talent yeah and um, and then I also I I wasn't quite sure I'd worked in the production office at the Greif company in L A and so I had a lot of the you know the paperwork side of it that that right. didn't interest me but I I knew I could work in that if I right. ever needed to and so I kind of focused on those two parts of the of the business one creative and one more kind of logistical office because of the school there was there any kind of film scene there like production oh, companies or anything not that i knew of at the time and the and the and the film school there was new and so it was um uh, it, it hadn't really cemented itself in the community yet okay uh, and so um we were we were able to you know, when we shot our student films, we were able to, you know, find find actors from the local theater. And we were doing some outreach stuff and just kind of integrating the school into the community a little bit. But most people had never heard of it and still haven't. Wow. Okay. And yeah. it's still there. Closed down about three years ago. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. It was only around six or eight years, something like that. Maybe. Maybe less. 
Maybe fewer. Man. <laughs> Did you go back and raid? You're like, I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this. <laughs> <laughs> no, when we were leaving, though, um, when I was moving, we um, were moving out of our little condo that me and my three three buddies rented, um, or two buddies rented, and uh, we, we decided to have a, a house cooling party. We'd never heard of a house cooling party. There were always house warming parties, yeah. but we were moving out, so we were like, man, let's, let's throw a rager. And uh, we took... <laughs> We took we took a bunch of the lights from the from the film school and took yeah. them to our house and lit up our whole like oh outside of our house God. we had cornhole tournaments outside until you know midnight or whatever and uh, and you know the, had all the had all the lights back at the film school by Monday morning by our graduation nobody knew so that's all <laughs> oh my God enjoyed that time in Greenville South Carolina still love that place I it's it's a good it's a good town and i hear that you know i hear that you know knoxville has has kind of tried it, the, whoever the officials are that yeah. that i hear about uh kind of look at greenville to see how their um their growth has gone over the last 15 or 20 years because yeah. they had a downtown that you didn't go to yeah and then they built a single sided suspension bridge uh that was kind of an architectural marvel and built this park around it and things started to pop up yeah. And uh so it's kind of gone through a very similar renaissance that that Knoxville has it just went through it 5 years earlier. My friend Cynthia, do you know Cynthia Roberson? Mm-mm. She lives down there and I thought about I was like, man, I ought to just pick a weekend and just go crash on her couch and yeah. go check it out cuz mm-hmm. everything she posts it seems really cool and really nice. And I've had friends that have had to visit there for work and I've hit her up and she's like, "Oh, go to these restaurants, go to these bars." Like it Yeah, it's nice. a cool place. Um it's got a bit of a Chattanooga vibe to it. Okay. Like the, there's some old money and you know, there's, it, it's very white, you know, okay. and, and, and very seersucker and okay. it, you know what I'm saying? A weekend would be good <laughs> enough. Then. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, it, I'm just looking for the food and the beer. <laughs> yeah. And it's a great, and it's a great yeah. place for that. Yeah. Um, it's not the most culturally diverse place okay. in the world, but it is a, a place that's nice to visit and yeah. be a tourist for, for a weekend. For 48 hours. For 48 hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how long was that program there? Was it four uh, so, years, two no, years? No, it was, it was a year, about a year and a half. Do you, okay. So in a, any of this time, are you studying anybody that you would like to emulate? No, I mean, I, okay. because I was still, I was still in the acting headspace. Okay. Like I was okay. still thinking about that. I mean, I about got laughed out of my first day of film school because they said, "What? What's the most recent movie you've watched?" And I said, "Dumb and Dumber." <laughs> and they were like, "Oh, oh, Dumb and Dumber." Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, you got to admit that's a fucking hilarious movie. It is a hilarious <laughs> movie. That's amazing. Yeah, but everybody else was like, you know, no Metropolis or you know whatever. Oh my God. You know, Lumiere Brothers oh <laughs> workers le- workers leaving the uh, <laughs> the factory. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't snobby enough for for a real <laughs> film school education. You're like, no, no, Barton Fink is the best of the Coen Brothers. <laughs> Oeuvre. Oeuvre. Wait, <laughs> did I say that that Ron Howard was my favorite director? Yeah. Coen Brothers. Oh man, oh. there's another. You talk about varied. Good yeah. God, man. Yes, from yeah. Blood Simple to Raising Arizona. Sure, to Miller's Crossing is one of my favorites. Yeah, and I mean Roger Deakins is the man too. He's a, just one of the best, if not the best. He does cinematographer more than one film a year. Like yeah, like well, he didn't do what was it that he did? He not do Hail Caesar because he was doing like Spectre. Well, uh, not Spectre. What was the uh, uh, Skyfall. Skyfall. Yeah. yeah. James Bond movie. Yeah, I think he has done every single one. Yeah, I think he missed like he I, I thought he missed one maybe, maybe not, but I thought that he had, they had to get somebody else to DP one of their most recent films uh, Still, because I he think, wasn't available. Well, and you know who their original DP was? Uh-uh. Sonnefeld. Really? Who did Men in Black yeah. and all that? Yeah. He did I think the first 5 or 6 really? of their films. Yeah. Yeah. He um Deacons cracks me up because I think one of the best films he's ever done, he did in the last five years, which is Sicario. Sicario yes. is one of the best shot films I've ever yes, seen. Yes, agreed. They I, made a sequel, didn't they? Yeah, I heard it, it was, was some as MAGA bullshit. It, it was very good. It was not as good. Yeah. Which is sad because those two characters, Brolin and uh, 
Benicio del Toro's yeah. characters were unbelievable in the first one. Yeah. And then the second one, I was like, man, this kind of sucks. Different yeah. director. I think. Oh, same, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sicario was fantastic. Sicario. I haven't seen the new one. Uh, his one shot movie, the the Warner, eighteen seventeen. Is that oh what no, called? that's Mendes. I thought I thought Sicario's that was... was Dennis Villeneuve. Sorry, Deacons. Oh, Deacons. Yeah, I did see nineteen seventeen. Nineteen seventeen. That's was... that's him, right? Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. It was crazy. That's a it, cinem- cinematographic marvel. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's actually God. It's two shots, right? I just turned into the guy on Reddit. Well, actually, <laughs> I think it's actually like uh, 12 shots yeah. or something. Seemingly two I, shots, right? I think as I watched it, I found three cuts. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know where the hell else he cut it. Yeah. Like, you can't tell. Like, there's yeah. one point where the guy passes out. I was like, okay, there's yeah. a cut. Oh, okay. There's, good. there's, <laughs> one, there's one where he passes a black wall. I was like, there's yeah. another cut. Yeah. I think it's because I watched, there's a Hitchcock film called uh, Rope. Where it's kind of the same conceit where it was all shot in a, an apartment and it's all shot as a wonder. Yeah. But it's, I think there are like five cuts in it. Gotcha. And like one of them is literally just somebody turned their back to the camera and you can see <laughs> their their jacket just stop moving for half a second. Yeah. And then it cuts back. And then back. it cuts to whatever but else. that's how 1917 was. Like as I sat there and watched it, I was like, okay, I found three. I yeah. have no idea where the rest are. Yeah, it'd be fun Easter egg experiment. Good yeah. film school scene study. <laughs> it's it's really good. Yeah. It didn't deserve to win Best Picture, but it was really good. Yeah. It didn't uh, win Best Picture, no, did it? Yeah. No. Hell now I'm trying to remember. Oh, uh the, the, which I still uh, have not watched Parasite. Parasite, yeah. That guy's that guy's unbelievable too. His films. Yeah. Yeah, I can go film nerd, man. He did a, this monster film called The Host that is funny and heartwarming. And not really that scary. But yeah, it's a monster film. I'm sure I'll, I'll. I'm sure I'll be his biggest fan in like five years. I'm always five years late for shit. I'm like, have you guys heard Life of Pablo by Kanye West? It is fantastic. <laughs> have you heard this guy Wes Anderson? <laughs> have you heard this guy Paul Thomas Anderson? <laughs> I could make a huge film nerd joke and say. Oh, yeah, there will be blood. No, no, no. Resident Evil. And there, <laughs> there's two Paul Thomas Andersons. One of them does shitty I films with Mila that. Jovovich. Yes. And one of them like does... Dawn of the Dead or, yeah. uh, or Shaun of the Dead or no, something. No. He, God, some all in that vein. Yeah. Like, but yeah, I, I will argue the re- first Resident Evil film is actually really good. Man, I'm so bummed that you don't have a better film nerd to talk to about. Like I, I feel like I let you down no. by, 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 no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you one. I'm like, don't watch resident. Evil. Good God. No. Yeah. Thank you. No, no. Uh, I, need, I need your list. <sighs> My list is, I will say <laughs> if I'm going to recommend any movie and I think it's one of the best, the a few of the best films of the last 10 years. Cause Zach, this guy, Zach and I had this, this guy Creed is probably the best film of the last 10 years. Okay. The Rocky yeah. film. Uh, but I don't know how much of that is tied into that I love Rocky. Yeah, yeah, you so forgot much. you're a big Rocky fan. Uh, the f- best film I've seen, one of the best films I've seen in the past 10 years is Midnight Special. Don't read anything. Don't watch a trailer. Just watch it. Okay. It'll take 20 minutes for it to sink in. Okay. Like, it just starts and goes. It's, you know, Michael Shannon... He was Zod mm-hmm. in the Man of Steel. Mm-mm. One of the best living actors right now. Okay. Michael Shannon. He's from Kentucky. Uh, All the good ones are. <laughs> All the good Bens are from Kentucky. All the good Bens are Kentucky. <laughs> uh, Isn't Brad Pitt from Kentucky? Uh, yeah. Johnny Depp is from Johnny Kentucky. Johnny Depp, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, What's the other one? George, uh, George Clooney's from Kentucky. Yep. Noah Edgerton. He was in Warrior. He's been yeah. in a ton of shit. He was in it. Sam Shepard's in it. Yeah. If I can get to it, Kirsten Dunst is in it, but that's kind of a little bit. The of Commonwealth. Sport. Yeah. There's a lot of, they're, they're having a good moment uh, exporting uh, oh, country, no. country music now. Sorry. Too. All of those are people who are in Midnight Special. Oh, sorry. gotcha. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We're going down two I think I nodded off there for a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh Midnight Special is a great film. Yeah. And it's, I don't know how to sell. It's Michael Shannon. Uh, taking his kid back from a cult. That sounds fascinating. And it's him and his brother, Joel Edgerton, running. Gotcha. Him. That's how it starts. Okay. 
and it's 20 minutes of what's going on? What's <laughs> happening? But then something happens like, oh shit, this is something completely different. Like it's f- fantastic. The inciting incident. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, that would be create. Well, if you don't like Rocky that much, but midnight special is the one I would recommend okay. to anybody. Cool. Uh, but you got to watch it. Like there's one buddy of mine. I was like, don't watch it in the background while you're working. Watch it. Like you got to pay attention. <laughs> you bastard. Or I'm going to yell at you. Uh, okay. So you're in South Carolina. Got done with friends. that. Yeah. Got done with that. Um, and was there, as part of our program, I was going to say, was there any thought to go back to LA at that point or not really? I'd gotten my belly full on that. Okay. And I, 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 maybe if, if, uh, we didn't have such a good, op, such good opportunity here. Okay. So I, uh, at, part of our program was an internship. We had to do an internship for okay. the last six months. So I, they would place you in one, but I found my own. Yeah. Um, working with um, Michael Underwood, uh, who's a director, used to live here in Knoxville. And he just took me under his wing. And uh, I moved back up here, stayed with my parents for free. He Michael paid me as much as he could or I deserved, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I, I just became his, pretty much his assistant. Uh, and I learned so much, man. I learned... I, I learned 10% of what I know in film school and 90% of what I know working with Holy him shit. for a year, you know, yeah. and it was just once we got, once we really got digging into stuff. Um, what was the scene like there? Was it mainly stuff through scripts networks or was it? Yeah, he, he did a lot of different stuff. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was with, we had a really good run for five years. Um, doing promos for HGTV and DIY network. We started doing them for DIY. And then, um, a lot of the folks that were running DIYs, creative services department, um, they kind of merged together with HGTV's creative services department. And, um, when, when scripts kind of restructured those two networks together as the home category. Yeah. So we were we were we were working with the AAA team, and they all got called up to the majors. And so you know we got we went up with them, and and okay. so we ended up getting bigger budgets and more producers on set and more oh. scrutiny. So it was <laughs> like a be careful what you wish for yeah. kind of thing. It was still great. We you know, but for a while, for a couple of years, we were we were the little rogue crew that nobody paid attention to. And yeah. They brought great stuff home, and everybody was happy. Well, now that you're doing the Property Brothers and and Chip and Joanna Gaines, like producers are going to want to go and make sure that you're doing right. doing what they need and that the talent is taken care of and all that. So, um, we kind of, we, we kind of grew with that department over yeah. there. Um, and, uh, we actually, the, one of the first, the first year long projects I had with, with Underwood was a project called, uh, change the world. Um, Jimmy, gosh, what is her last name? It was her project. Uh, and it was just a, it was an HT, HGTV kind of PSAE, uh, like a interstitial kind of spot where they were, they were highlighting people who were making differences in their communities. And so okay. somebody would nominate, you know, someone who's volunteers for Habitat for Humanity in New Orleans and they rebuilt a bunch of houses after Katrina. This is how they're yeah. changing the world in, you know, New Orleans. Yeah. And so we did one of those every month. We would travel, shoot, bring it home, edit it. And that was a, a year long project that we worked on. That we, it was really it was four guys in a van. It was me, Michael Underwood, DP Josiah Morgan, and um, and then Chris Durfee was our gaffer on that. And Chris Durfee and I were on a scout together this morning. He's 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 still my guy, um, but now I'm the director and the DP. <laughs> so he's so uh, he he's he's still. Uh, it's funny. He's he's gotten to watch me watch me come up actually. This is an interesting story. I I, I had I was represented um, by uh, Cindy Swicegood, eighteen carat yeah. talent modeling agency when yeah. I was twelve years old, thirteen years old. I did a commercial for HGTV Romance Week as an actor. Uh, my first day working with Michael Underwood at Tantrum Pictures, I saw the HGTV Romance Week Beta SP sitting in his tape library, and I was like, "Did you direct that?" And he was like, "I sure did." I was like, oh, oh, I was one of the, I was the kid on the lips, lip shaped couch. He's like, you are kidding me. <laughs> and so it's amazing. I, it is. And so I, and Chris Durfee was on that shoot too. So, so 
when people ask how long me and Chris Durfee have been working together, I tell them 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> but he's gaffing. He's gaffing two spots. I'm shooting a commercial for uh, State Farm and Habitat for Humanity next next week, and then also for Boar's Head, the deli. Oh meat, yeah, or the yeah, you know those guys. Where are they based out of? I don't know. It's we're we're doing it through HGTV. It's kind okay. of a branded entertainment type deal. Okay. Is yeah. that uh we're going to still circle back, but have you noticed a change to people going to more digital or is yeah. it uh, or change. going to more like uh YouTube digital versus yeah. like uh broadcast? Yeah. Like it's huge. It's, like budgets it's going night up and day. for YouTube versus broadcast. Totally. Yeah. That's where the eyeballs are now. Yeah. So it's completely inverted where advertising dollars go yeah from what i'm seeing yeah um on air broadcast commercials is what you wanted 10 years ago those are the jobs that you wanted and then the the digital budgets were nothing yeah Um, advertising on social media wasn't important uh as important then now i think it's completely flip-flopped i mean cord cutting yeah very few people have cable anymore yeah um so if you i mean television advertising is incredibly cheap now yeah because there's a whole lot of you know there's a whole lot of spots out there um but yeah the the, so the budgets are going to digital and then so are the uh so is the production value you know stuff that you see on on digital is really it's really getting a lot better well and i see like i know and i've done work for them hannah slaughter's team yeah at their digital team where it used to be just her and nick yeah. And that was about it. Mm-hmm. And now it's like that team keeps growing and their budgets keep going up to where they're getting to do all this cool stuff and choose. choose. We just shot a badass spot for them last two weeks ago. Yeah. Hannah and Nick. Yeah. Hannah Slaughter and Nick Hollinsby. And I mean, they're they're getting yeah, they're getting some some really good creative coming out of there and really good stuff. Yeah. And uh I'll I'll show it to you before before I leave. Okay, it's a great spot. I've done. It was wild there for a while. She was having me do these mood boards. Oh yeah, for their programming yeah. to where it was just like she's like, oh, just work on this and just do this. I was like, you're going to pay me how much money to do a damn mood board? And she was yeah. like, yeah, yeah. It's like, holy shit. Oh, it's big boys. They're I know. You know they're they're really doing it. I just got an email from somebody over there that I know that I'm like, you're not piecing together that you know me. Like oh, it's so funny, cool. like Hannah. You, you get the email voice that that they that yeah yes. yeah yeah. That's she was great. like, "Now Hannah Slaughter recommended that you were a graphic designer," and I almost went, "Yeah, I've known you for like ten years." Yeah, exactly. Like I'm really close with your. Did you? Oh, that I was you. Fell off the. Sorry. <laughs> it's like this. Uh, at one point, I had neighbors that had seven kids in that tiny house next door. Oh yeah. And uh, their two twin, three or four year olds. Got into the van that was immovable, put it in neutral, ran back, hit my house. No. Or hit the carport. So whenever I hear shit like that, I'm like, wait, yeah. what was that? What did <laughs> They crashed at your house that night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dad jokes. God. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she, I'm really close and I worked with her cousin and I, I've seen her, I've known her for like 10 years and she emailed me in the in email voice. I'll go. Yeah. Come on, man. Come on. Yeah. You know who the hell Yeah. <laughs> Send her a selfie. Yeah. It's like, hey, this guy. it's me. Yeah. It's me. Yeah. Uh, We're really fortunate to have that yeah. that uh uh entity uh, cocl- conglomerate. <laughs> yeah, that that entity <laughs> over there. We really are. I mean, you know, people when the merger happened between Discovery and and Scripps, the marketplace got worried that they were going to leave and they still yeah. might, you know. Um, so I, I think we're all really fortunate to have them and we're getting to do really, really good stuff with really talented people. They've got a really, they've got a building full of really talented, uh, people that that I know that we work with. They, uh, I was looking up what the, what the word was that Haseeb gave me earlier. He was talking about like business strategy and stuff for me. And he was like, there's one bucket called randomly. He was like, these are the random ass jobs that come out of nowhere that you don't know how they came to you or they came to you through a friend of a friend of a friend. Right. And and I, I just started laughing at him. I was like, I literally got these two of these yesterday. And he was like, yeah. He's like, you need to pr- figure out ways to position yourself to where those will come to you more often. Yeah. And I was like, well, one of the big things is having discovery here in yeah. town. 
because you ne- they're so separated and segregated that it's, one department never yeah, doesn't they're even siloed people completely siloed to where you can end up w- working for four different divisions and yeah. they have no idea yeah which is the only people who know is a county yeah exactly <laughs> and yeah it's it's interesting because that can help you or that can hurt you I'm, yeah you know that you can oh I worked with this great production company you should use them on your stuff or yeah. it's like. No, they're mine. They're my yeah. production company. You can't use them. Yeah. And we're fortunate. All the departments that we work with over there are very good about sharing us. And our production company is big enough to where um, we, to where, you know, we can handle four different, yeah. you know, we can, we can handle working with four different departments. No Which, problem. Before I forget, I also saw one of your guys last night, two nights ago, Eric. Eric Baker? Yeah. Yeah. He's great. I, the ten, he was judging the Tennessee Songwriters thing on Wednesday night at the oh, BSU. Cool. Yeah. And uh, he remembered me from last year, which kind of blew my mind. I was like, he's a great dude. I man. almost went, dude, you meet so many people. Yeah. And then I thought about it for a second. I was like, I'm two feet taller than you. Yeah, of course you remember. Yeah, he's exactly. like, that beard's getting out of control, man. I was like, shit, I thought I'd trimmed it, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's been like a year. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> Eric Baker's a great dude, man. He's very yeah. talented. He's going to, he promised me he'd come on the podcast. He's going to come around. Yeah, hopefully next couple of weeks. He had a big, uh, he had, uh, you know, he had a lot of prep to do to get ready for these two shows. He just had it the at in February Valentine's Day. And yeah, the day before, the two the big day, Valentine's day, after, day yeah. shows. Yeah, and so I'm trying to catch up with him. Those have now. been like become this big thing. I know it's that crazy. they started is like good for him. The first year he did it, it's like, oh shit, he's gonna play the Bijou. That's a good deal. And now it's like two shows. It's like, yeah. holy shit, man! Yeah. This is people were planning for this. Yeah, man. Eric Eric Baker, nine night residency. Yeah, <laughs> I tell you a funny thing to look up. There used to be a show called Scruffy City Roots that was filmed at uh, shoot the Square Room. Oh, cool! That China Bracken kind of helped put on, and uh, kind of in. There's Music City Roots in Nashville, and this was our version. And there, uh, it was filmed like one time. And it was Cruz Contreras, some mm-hmm. Black Lilies, yeah. and Eric Baker doing uh, Bye Bye Love. Together. From the Everly Brothers. Good. And it's on YouTube. And Good. it's amazing. That's great. It's amazing. That's great. And because I remember that's a, f- I'd always heard of Eric Baker and I'd heard Eric Baker. That was the first night I ever saw him. And he passed by me. I was like, holy shit, you are a tiny, tiny man. Yeah. He's like, he's not, he's not <laughs> tall. He looks bigger on TV. Yeah. Not to, not to mock or anything. No, it no. was just, he walked by me. I was like, geez, I was like, I'm a freak. It's not him. It's, it's I'm not a you. freak. No, oh, come on, Jody. <laughs> Come on. I am taller than Charles Barkley, damn it. Uh, I am a two freak. inches. I yeah. am a freak. Uh, um, okay, so South Carolina, you move back here, start learning under him. Under Underwood. Uh, and then I had a kid. And I was like, you know, the freelance game is very uh, spotty. I was going to say, me. when I first met you, it was with the Benz in yeah. the Thunder Block. Oh, yeah. I started my own company for four years. I forgot about okay. that. Okay. Yeah. While I was working with Underwood, I had a, a production company called Patchwork Films. I yeah. went downstairs. Was at, was uh, Roman involved at that, too? Roman worked with me quite a bit. Okay. I was the only... I felt like everybody was kind of doing their own thing. Yeah. Roman Roman would freelance for me a lot. Yeah. Um, and I would freelance for him if he brought a job in. So yeah. we, we we worked together quite a bit. He was right next door. So it was Roman Karpinek was in the first unit, and then it was me in the next two, Patchwork. So yeah. Ben, uh, and then we had, uh, Ben Hubbard and Ben Adams. Yeah. And then we had an attorney named Jackson Finner in the last one. Oh my God. Who's running for, uh, running for County law director. Is he really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Those times were weird. Like I, I was talking to somebody about, they're like, how did you meet this person? I was like, we used to go every Tuesday to La Esperanza. Yeah. I was like, talking to Tuesday at La Esperanza. And I met the first ones I met, I think were Hubbard and Adams via Twitter. And they invited me. And I remember the first time I went, there must have been 25 people there. Yeah. Because it was big. like Hubbard, Adams, you, Haseeb, Brad Miller, yeah. Andrew May. Yeah. Like Jay. I can never remember Jay's last name. Glasses, a little bit older than me. I can never remember his name. He's We're still connected on LinkedIn. Every once in a while he'll say something. But it was just a massive group of people. 
that it was all dudes, which yeah. always cracked me up. <laughs> it's like Jenny Andrews never came and hung out. Yeah, with she didn't want to hang out with us. <laughs> Us yeah. stinky idiots. Yeah. And uh, hanging out there. I think maybe even Sean Osserbrooks would come sometimes. Yeah. When he was at Remedy. What an era that was. The underground. Yeah. Uh, and where Ben stuff. Adams would draw on the cups at yeah. Remedy and just leave them to where yeah. there was like a mountain of cups. Yeah. So Underwood's office, Tantrum Pictures, was right above Remedy. So oh, I, okay. So I got to know the Osserbrooks pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, that was a weird time. Like, it was just all via Twitter. Everybody yeah. kind of, uh-huh. well, or outside. Excuse me, but I think, like, Brad Miller even was that way. Brad really? Brad Andrew. Yeah. Well, Jenny Andrews hooked me up with that whole crowd, the under the underground crowd. She was like, it's just a couple hundred bucks a month. You should be able to do it and just yeah. start your company from there. I was like, that's brilliant. Yes, I'll do it. Um, I wonder if and, anything's down there now. Uh, Grant Barton was down there doing his state love stuff last time I knew. Okay. I don't know if he's still down there or not. I feel like just meandering just for old time's sake. Well, we should down go there. down there. Yeah. I had a meeting with uh, Jesse Ringer on the hundred block oh, okay. uh, on Wednesday. And I was meeting with Ben Hubbard afterwards for, to work on some stuff for his company. And, uh, and part of me, uh, you know, we ended up meeting at Awaken Coffee, the yeah. old remedy building. But I was like, I'm gonna see if we can just get get down in the underground for yeah. this for this ten o'clock meeting. See yeah. if that works out. And and I didn't. I should have reached out to Grant because I think I think he might still be down there. Or just say something to Mary Beth. Just be like, yeah. hey, I'm gonna go downstairs. Or hell, just walk in like you own the place, like everybody else always did. Just go, start walking down the stairs. I remember there was one time I went down there to film something, and I asked like Hubbard and Adams. I was like, can I go down there? And they're like, maybe check with Jenny, and Kate, if yeah. you want to. Yeah. I check with Jenny, and Jenny was like. Wait, who are you? And yeah. I was like, Well, I'm Jody. I'm friends. With-. Okay. She was like, I really don't give a shit. Yeah, <laughs> you can like, do okay. whatever, do what you want. <laughs> I was like, Okay, never mind. You're Sorry. an adult. <laughs> yeah, I did a first Friday down there. I did, I did a bunch of uh, before the phonography thing. Well, it it may have been after the first phonography that Ben Hubbard and Jenny Andrews did. I did uh, just a bunch of cell phone prints, like forty or fifty prints that I'd taken when I was traveling sure with Underwood. I was down there. Yeah, and I, I still have a- that phonography shirt. In do you? Yeah. I printed like 40 or 50 prints on wood and did a show down there. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. 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 Bought a bunch of PBR and Boda Box and Lenny I remember the shop. wood because I was like, yeah. holy shit. Like, mm, yeah. Next level, man. I sold every single one of them. Oh, my God. Every single one of them. It was crazy. That phonography thing was always a lot of fun. Yeah, it was cool. Uh, although now it would be too high end, too falute, high falutin. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hashtag no filter. Hashtag no filter. Yeah. Hashtag, what was it? S O O C. Yeah, yeah, that works. Yeah. yeah. I remember then when that was a big thing. It's like, who gives a shit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just take a good damn photo. Mm-hmm. What are you talking about straight yeah. out of camera? Yeah, there's some snobbery afoot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, came back, worked for him, worked for yourself. Yep. And uh, then uh, when I, right after I turned 30, time to establish, right? <laughs> so, uh, did y'all ever float around to, because there's the production companies in town, like, Elastic, River, yeah, Red Door, uh, Red Arrow, Red Arrow, and I'm forgetting. Yeah, the there's one. Draft. There's um, Draft Agency was was Jow Pro at the time. I think that's. Oh how you yeah, say yeah, it. yeah. Uh, and then um, Lock and Key came up right around that yeah. same time. Uh, I didn't really work with any of those guys. I met Andy Fellu for the first time like three weeks ago. He's, oh, he's a, awesome. A great dude. Yeah. Like, how have we not met each other? He sent me a really sweet text the next day and was like, after, you know, after hearing about you for a long time, it was really great to meet you and, awesome. and see that you're a good dude. And I was like, man, I'm glad to meet you, too. It was great talking well, to what, you. I like Jowl Pro and, and Lock and Key was like, to begin with, we're like two people each. Yeah. And that was it. So that's why you probably didn't work with it. Yeah, the same exactly. Thing. It was, yeah. It was solopreneurship. Yeah. And uh, that's and that's how Pop Fizz started, too. Um, really was was with Brian Allen and, and Brent Collier. They both just two two guys. Brent Collier's another one that was in that group. He'll yeah. kill me for not saying that. <laughs> Love you, Brent. Yeah, he's he was one that was in that crew. Yeah, he was. He's always been super nice to me. He's even a though wonderful we're not dude. Yeah, super close. Yeah. I didn't know where I stood with Brent for a long time just because he's so quiet. Yeah, now I love the man. He's so sweet. Yeah, great dude. But yeah. Uh, it seemed to be, I still remember sitting down at, oh God, 
I know this was a unique experience. Sitting with uh, Hubbard drinking beers at Barley's. I mean, that never happened. Yeah. Ever. Ever. Yeah. Never. It was the one time we yeah. did that. Was yeah. One was it 10 o'clock on a Tuesday? <laughs> A.M.? <laughs> yeah. Probably. Uh, but I remember him and I, and I think it was Hasib, too, t- sitting around talking and him saying, he's like, this is the future. Working for companies, I don't know about that. He's like, all these people who can pull from freelance and almost like co-op work. He's like, yeah. I kind of feel like that's a thing. And now even like with a company like Pop Fizz, you still pull in people we have to. from all over because it's... Yeah, because like, you have you have to right-size your production. You have to right-size your... You have to right size your whatever the project is. You have to right size your crew for that. And sometimes you can do that with internal people. And sometimes you can do what you can with internal people. And then you backfill with, you know, freelancers or sometimes it, you know, we don't have a gaffer on staff. Yeah. If we get a project that needs something that, that looks, you know, we really, really need it to be national level TV spot. We we hire a gaffer for that. So we can do it. We can do some damage, you know, That's, with lighting stuff ourselves. Yeah. We do really great work, but um, you know, some sometimes the 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 deliverable needs you to have yeah. that level of yeah. person in that position. Um, and it's the ability to be pliable. Yeah, to be I like, think so. You know what? We need to set dress this thing. Let's call Rebecca to come in yeah, here. Yeah, absolutely. And really make this look solid. exactly. And and also it allows us to always say yes to to jobs too yeah. because oh, now nope, we're busy that day. We've never said that, you know, yeah. we'll split our team up and, yeah. you know, get, get the right, get the right crew in the right place at the right time. Um, so I, I agree. I think there is something to that. Um, I think that something that Brian Allen really kind of brilliantly did with, with pop fizz was he hired a bunch of Swiss army knives, people that could do a lot of different things. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. and I think, I think that was smart and I, the second he hired me, I disagreed. I, I, I disagreed with him on that. I was like, I think that if I, I think that if you are going to hire, a, if you are going to color be a, a color grade a commercial, you need to send it to a colorist. I think if you're going to if you're going to edit commercials, you need to be an editor. And I think you know, without saying it, I, I started to notice like, okay, I'm a director and a DP, but like, we're not shooting every day. Yeah. yeah, we're not doing pre-pro every day. Like, I need to be useful around here. Yeah. So as much as 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 much as I uh, <laughs> as much as I don't love to edit, I noticed that you know for the health of the company, I needed Need needed to, do, to do it, and I needed to be um, needed to continue to be useful even on a rainy day when there's you know when there's not a, a not a five hundred thousand dollar commercial coming down the pipeline, you know. When when it rains and I am is nothing but a big mud pit and you can't shoot there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because you can't predict the weather. Right. Um, and so I I think that I think that you know what you said that 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 Ben Hubbard said about pulling pulling a lot of different people in and kind of creating yeah. your team. Um, I think that's right, and I also think that what Brian Allen did was right, um, and hired a bunch of people that can do a lot of different things. Or even just, even if you hire a bunch of connectors, they're like, mm-hmm. you know, I can't do this, but I know the person who yeah. can do this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I feel like in TV production, commercial, what it shows, whatever, you've got to figure out, like, okay, we got to be able to do this. Here's also, I feel like with budgets too, like you got to figure out that's like, another thing. This is what we can afford. This is what it's like. We're all going to have to just pull up our, our bootstraps on this one and just get it done. Yeah. That that's another thing is that we, because we're on staff, we're able to work within budgets, you yeah. know, because it's, you know, we're not, we don't have to be $2,000 a day directors, you know? Yeah. We can, yeah. we can, we can work it out. <laughs> I like that. We don't have to be. We'd like to be. Yeah. <laughs> we are sometimes. We are sometimes. Yeah, but not always. Yeah. 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 Oh, Budweiser's calling? Oh, yeah. we're $4,000 yeah. a day director. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll come with my own camera for five. <laughs> we, for six, you can get light. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. I don't need sound. No. Sound, that's too expensive. That's outside of the budget. Man. Yeah. We're going to shoot this off. Yeah. Uh, 
that's how I got to pop got to pop fizz though was was the the freelance game was scary for me you know when I was yeah. having a kid and and it I was gonna say but it came around right at that time didn't it my around the time you had you got a kid yeah that's that's pop when fizz I started at pop kinda, fizz kinda, yeah probably about six months later oh, okay. I, I still I still freelanced and I think I think my oldest daughter was about my oldest daughter was four months old when I started. Okay. When I started working at Pop Fizz, so because I remember, because I was working, I think at Pet Safe at the time, and DS was our agency, oh, yeah. and it kind of came out of felt like to us. I was like, well, this kind of came out of nowhere because we were, were contracted with River. Mm-hmm. I still remember. Good God, there was one guy at River I could have choked him, <laughs> and this even came up recently because it turns out a friend of mine who I should connect you with, who does these crazy motion graphics animations and stuff. Uh, for they do them for a lot of uh, discoveries. I keep wanting to call it Scripps Networks. Yeah, me too. I'm still getting over it. Discovery and UT. Their their company name is called Vivanel. Hmm. It's Rob and Rachel Travis. They're over in South Knoxville. Okay. Everything mushrooms building. Yeah, they do great work. It's all like motion graphics and illustrated, like openings for shows and stuff. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Cinema 4D probably. Or, yeah. yeah, and I was talking to Rob, and it turns out he was the editor on Pet Safe's commercial. Oh, at at Design River. Sensor? Oh, River. At okay. River, because we were contracted through River. And I just remember I was the one who came up with the concept for the commercial. I shot it on a little crappy <laughs> point and shoot, just to have something that I could then show them. And then the other guy came in, and he just fucked it up. Really, to where. We were sitting in there in the editing office, and at one point I just stood up and walked out. Yeah. And my boss at the time, she was just like, she walked out. She's like, what's going on? I was like, I'm going to fucking punch him. Because he's taking it, and he's making it good. He's putting the Benny Hill music under this shit. <laughs> what the fuck, man? That's not the point of this damn thing. And she was like, you need to go in there and stand up for this. I was like, am I going to get fired? And she was like, you're not going to get fired. You'll be fine. So I went in there, and she was like, we're paying them a lot of money for this. This is stupid. Yeah, it needs to be what we want. She was angry. Like, she was kind of angry that they were upsetting me, because yeah. she's a mom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was, somebody's met her with her yeah. bear cub. And uh, I went in there, and it's still not what I want. It's still too hokey Yeah, for what I want. I wanted it to be all from the dog's perspective, uh, showing how the product worked. And they were just like, let's put some light, fluffy music and show the mm-hmm. house at the beginning. I was like, yeah. don't. The whole concept was it had no sound except for the dog running through the yard for like the first 10 seconds. So if you're doing dishes and all of a sudden you hear it cut out from these loud ass commercials. Yeah. Because this is 10 years ago. Yeah. I was like, no, you want somebody to go, wait, what the fuck's going on? Yeah. And like, And they're like, no, we need to put music. We need to show the house. We need establishing shots. It's like, no. And it's interesting. Everybody's got their own needs. When yeah. I mean, you, you've heard of death by client. Like, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it, it we're we try to be artists at heart yeah. and then it seems like when you're when your baby gets watered down a little bit it really hurts your feelings but how <laughs> funny is that that we were the client we were the one i was the one pushing <laughs> to be more abstract my other idea for it was our product was the first uh high-end wireless fence and i just wanted to do shots panning up i was like i can do this of just the system and it listing off all the specs and having the music from 2001 the mm-hmm. thus also, also Spartacus, whatever it's called. Sprat- Zarathustra. Sprat- Sprat- Zarathustra. <laughs> but have that and then have the last thing just be an establishing shot of it and said the most advanced t- technology to shock the shit out of your dog. Perfect. For a, an online only campaign. And I pitched that to our brand person. She was like, no. No. <laughs> and I was like, God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, that gets some get some looks. She was yeah. like. Uh huh. But will it play in Paducah? <laughs> she was so. I was like, I don't know. I thought it was funny. I thought yeah. it was worth a shot. She's like, that might get you fired. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that would. <laughs> the most advanced piece of technology to shock the shit out of your dog. Yeah. And she was like, no, no. I was like, okay. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take, man. Yeah, exactly. I had to get it out, man. <laughs> uh, okay. We're going to pop fizz. Been working yeah, there man. ever since. So you've kind of been with the company and seen their growth over time. Yeah, I think I was hired number four or five. Jeez. And we got 13 people now. Not much attrition. Cause we lost one person who retired. She she came and worked for us for a few years and then wanted to spend more time with her family. But that's about it. Man. We keep keeping the team, growing the team. 
it's tough because we're getting into that tweener territory of like being a flat company and yeah and now we kind of need to not necessarily silo up but we do need to you know it's hard to manage it's hard for brian to manage 12 or 13 people and so we kind of have to split that up a little bit and so we're we're trying to work through that we don't really i think brian told me one time he didn't want the company to be more than about 25 people before he just opened another office you know made it pop fizz nashville or which i mean we have a presence in nashville now but um you know before we just made it its own thing yeah and so we're you know we're in a sweet spot right now it's working it's working great have you all ever talked about or you just personally going bigger and actually doing film or anything yeah we have these talks that are you know quarterly offsites, and we kind of we kind of all go back and forth on on if we want to get into that world or not one of the the features specifically but we've decided as a company to make to put a lot more effort into original ideas okay for for linear tv shows and digital series as well so we're in a pretty big development push right right now um I think Brent Collier has probably built about, I don't know, 15 or 20 pitch decks for, for, wow. for, uh, for ideas that, that we've got. Some of them have sizzle reels with them. Like yeah. we've got a lot of, a lot of ideas. We're working with a guy, Kent Takano, um, who I recognize uh, that name. Yeah. I think he was the GM at like fine living network when they, okay. when, when that was a scripts property. Um, but he's, um, he's been around. He knows yeah. the, he knows the, the broadcast world. Um, and then, you know, coupled with the, the kind of newer, fresher, uh, energy that pop fizz brings to the table. I think it's, um, I think it's, it's a, it's a really good marriage there to, you know, have our, our ideas kind of have him shape, help us shape those have Kent help us shape those into, you know, viable television series. So that's what we're, that's what we're working on right now. Um, along with the, the, (laughs) the balance of, of of the rest of the work that we continue right. to, to have get. So how many are murder porn? Uh, yeah, we're, it's we, amazing we, that we that feel has like become this, that this massive industry. Yeah. We, f- we feel like that market has been cornered by, uh, uh, by other production companies. Yeah. So we don't really dig in, dig into it. Um, there's one production. I don't think we could do to where one of their main people came to me, want to help them with social, and it turns out the boss doesn't even want them to have a social presence. I was yeah. like, you all should be leaning in hard to, to that everything you do is murder porn. Yeah. Like you, this is a thing now. Yeah. It's like, you don't want to get pigeonholed, but you should be, I, I don't know. It was kind of funny. It was, she said it even took an act of God to get him to put up a website. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. I was like, you're so far back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I look at everything people are doing, like what you all are doing or what like lock and key and seeing just like, I love that lock and key makes a big deal about their sizzle reels. Yeah. Like once they a year, they're work, just man. like, Oh no, we're dropping our sizzle reel in five days. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah. They really do a good job of, of all that. All their stuff looks awesome. And you know, I lamented a little bit. I wish that, I don't know. I wish, I wish there was a, a, a way for us to work together on stuff, but right. you know, it's almost, it's a zero sum game. We're kind of going yeah. after the same clients. It's I, it, uh, cooperation, I guess, you know, yeah. would be something I, I wish we could lean in a little bit more on the yeah. co-op part of that, but we don't really know each other that well and don't really work together on much. We, we share freelancers, um, and they've got their clients and we've got our clients and sometimes we compete for the same ones. Uh, but everything I've ever seen come out of, of that place has been really great. It's funny to me that, because Andy, feel you, you know, the first time I met him was him sh- holding a damn DSLR on his shoulder at Waynestock in Relics. Good for him. Like, that's how they st- kind of started. That's awesome. Bootstrapping it. Yeah. And then shooting Rhythm and Blooms and... Him telling me that back in the day it would be he would shoot rhythm and blooms all day, go home, edit all night. So because Dogwood Arts wanted footage first thing in the morning yeah, before they, they start the next day. Yeah, I've talked to a couple of people who worked over there, and they said that that a lot of the music festival stuff is like that. I mean, they want to promote the music festival while the music festival is happening. Yeah, and um, that's that's tough, man. I mean, yeah. that's that's doing that's doing something the next guy might not do. Yeah, you know, and 
they've made a career it seems like with the music thing and good on them for doing that because yeah. it's they're making really making really great stuff and it seems like they got into it by just working hard and yeah. doing what they doing what they had to do to keep the lights to make on it work yeah. yeah that's great i'm I, I feel really fortunate that we have such a good community of creatives around here yeah. especially in the film and television world i feel like everybody's pushing pretty hard and i'm i'm happy to be to be a part of it and i feel comfortable doing it i hope i'm around for a long time yeah. you know doing it with the same same people so now my next goal is to get you to go up to fulton and talk to the kids there I'll do it. Did you know they have like a huge like Mm-mm. communications program up there? No, I spoke to a uh, high school class in Austin, Texas. One of my buddies is a journalism, digital media teacher there. I loved it, man. It was cool. A little yeah. 45 minute talk and then a 45 minute Q&A with all the kids. It was fun. Last time I was up there, I got to go tour the TV studio. I was like, good God, this is so much better. Because when I was up there, it was the big ass honking yeah. WBIR type <laughs> cameras. And it was like everything was amazing up there, so yeah. That, that's um, like I said, I hope I hope I'm doing this for a long time. And and when I when when I see people coming up, um, I want to be able to offer the same um, the welcoming feeling that I got from yeah. the freelance market and from everybody else in this industry, from the Chris Durfies of the world. Yeah, uh, they didn't know whether or not I was coming to take their job or not. They still yeah. brought me in and and. Um, so I actually just, I just picked up an intern from, uh, just hired an intern from, uh, Pellissippi, who's a great kid and he's working with me right now. And, um, I don't know, it's, 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 it's all I, I just want to give him as, I want to give him as much as I can. I want to, I want to give it all away because people have always, have always been, and even are still are very gracious and, 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 uh, they're, they're not possessive of their knowledge. They're great great at sharing yeah and i think that's what it takes ut gets the spotlight but pellissippi has a great video production department yeah i've seen a lot of the people that come out of it that they're all like just hard workers and want to yeah. do whatever it takes one of our hell i joke and say is our best guy at pop fizz we just got him from pellissippi last year <laughs> his name's austin christensen <laughs> i walked in i saw something that he did uh for me um a, a client that I brought to us and, and, and I brought him along because the budget was a little bit low and I, and I wanted to, I knew that he could do it on a budget and I, you know, walked in and said, guys, I'm sorry, but present company included, I think Austin's the best guy we got at the company. (laughs) (laughs) He's he's 20. (laughs) Well, that's 22. I go up and talk at, talk at phone because it's still the same kids that from when I went up there, it's all, yeah. You know, wealth inequality issues, all yeah, that. And problem. Every, everything I talk to him about is, it's like, you can make a living in art. You just got to be willing to work. You're going to have to work your ass off. Yeah. But there is a living in art. You might have to engineer your path a yeah. little bit. I was like, and a lot of what I've told them is, you're coming up in the greatest time in the world to find your own way. Because mm-hmm. with Instagram and everything else, I just saw an artist that I follow in Atlanta he did uh, branding and wraps and all this stuff for a uh, fish truck in Atlanta that is Killer Mike and T.I. run it. It's awesome. And I'm like, dude did that through Instagram. Yeah. It's like, that's insane. It's a great so, time yeah. to be alive. I mean, the it's amazing. You you used to go home at night and, uh, after 6 o'clock, you, you know, you were... You were home and you didn't have any time to work on your side hustle. Yeah. You know, if you had yeah. one, you, you couldn't work on your side hustle, yeah. you know, uh, but now with, with that computer you got sitting over there and yeah. the old inner tubes. <laughs> inner tubes. <laughs> yeah. That's a good part to go out yeah. on. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jody. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, thank you.